And welcome to tonight's Enfield Town Council regular meeting, Monday, January 23rd, 2023. The time is 7.02. And this meeting can also be viewed on YouTube. As a reminder, our overall goal for our public meetings and the Town Council and the Board of Ed is to have our meetings be orderly where the public is able to attend, participate, and listen. We expect that as elected and appointed officials, we maintain proper decorum while conducting the public's business. Our expectation is the same for the public. Everyone who attends a town council meeting or a board of ed meeting need to exhibit respect and responsible behaviors at all times and this will be greatly appreciated by all. Overall, uh, here on the town council side, I'm very happy with the order that's maintained um, by us up here on the dais and by the public. So uh, we will move forward with tonight's meeting. Uh, prayer, Councilor Mangini. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, our town clerk, Sheila Bailey, roll call, please. Councilor Mangini. Here. Councilor Nelson. Here. Councilor Pisner. Here. Councilor Santanella. Here. Councilor Ungayer. Here. Deputy Mayor Sakala. Here. Mayor Crisati. Here. Councilor Despard. Here. Councilor Finger. Here. Councilor Hopkins. Here. Councilor Ludwig. Here. Eleven members are present, none are absent. All right, before I read the fire evacuation announcement, uh, I do want to point out a few items on, on tonight's agenda for those in the audience and watching from home. The town manager has a brief presentation on economic development that will occur under her report tonight. And I'll be asking the council to table item F concerning the changing the, the how the town collects trash and recycling with the housing authority. Uh, then there may be some discussion on item I about the number of justice of the peace appointments. All right, uh, the fire evacuation announcement in the event of a fire, uh, there are exits in the back of the chambers and to my left in the audience's right, exit through the doors and downstairs into the parking lot. Next, the minutes of preceding minutes. Is there, there is one set of minutes to approve. Is there a motion? Motion. motion. Uh, Councilor Mangini, a second. Councilor Ungeyer. Uh All in favor, please raise your hands. Uh, unanimous, 11-0. All right, item six. Um, <clears throat> we're hearing a lot of concern from the public about speeding and other traffic issues, and there's been compounded by statewide pedestrian deaths, death numbers, and wrong way drivers. Uh, on behalf of the council, we're gonna welcome Chief Fox to tonight's meeting to give us an overview of the traffic issues and department initiatives. Uh, Chief Fox, welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alaric Fox, and as always, it continues very much to be my pleasure to serve uh, as Enfield's Chief of Police. Having watched the last few council meetings, uh, as the mayor indicated, there certainly has some, been some uh, consternation, some questions about uh, levels of motor vehicle enforcement activity and perhaps in a broader sense, driver behavior within the community. As luck would have it, that was tying in to the end of the year, which is when, amongst other times, I pull the department's data to take a look at where we are in comparison to previous years in a number of specific categories. I had the occasion to present this information before the Public Safety Subcommittee. Uh, several of you were present. I believe it was reasonably well received. I'm happy to present it this evening as well uh, in the larger picture for all of you. 
In 2022, and this is slightly dipped from last year, but not by much, the Enfield Police Department took 38,404 calls for service. That is 105.2 daily. That is an incredible number of calls for service. The men and women of the department are thrilled to serve the department, but please have no doubt, uh, 105 calls for service is a significant uh, commitment of your resources and certainly the resources that, that I shepherd as the chief of police. Within that figure is uh, 1,705 arrests. We continue to do everything in our power whenever possible to de-escalate, to try to avoid an arrest, to root individuals to social services, other mechanisms for care whenever it is appropriate. But you know, drunk driving offenses and uh, domestic violence offenses and, and felony offenses and, and robbery offenses, these are not situations that, that lend themselves in any way, shape, or form to a de-escalation situation. 1705 is 4.67 arrests daily. Against this backdrop of the 105 calls for service per day, I thought it important to emphasize for you that some of these calls for service are quick. Some of them you're going to measure with a, with a stopwatch. An assist to a citizen, somebody who's locked out, perhaps somebody that comes in for fingerprints, somebody that needs a quick assist pointed in the right direction could literally be a five-minute interaction. But weighing against that, and perhaps it goes without saying, but I wanted to give you some of the high points here. In calendar year 2022, this town saw a little bit more than one burglary per week. And that's a commitment uh, of, you know, so we had, so it's only a burglary, not when you're the homeowner that suffered that burglary. That's a commitment of a significant amount of department resources at least once a week. Crest activations, 16 activations times six department members that deploy out in the middle of the day or the middle of the night, sometimes for hours on end for very dangerous, very scary situations where as skilled as I'd like to think I am, as skilled as I like to think Captain Kazalowskis is, they're way beyond our skill set. 16 crest team activations. Domestic violence incidents, 240 in a calendar year. Um, 52 weeks in a year is a significant cause for concern. 98 DUI arrests, two per week. Uh, fraud cases, 214 in the course of a calendar year. Larceny, 721. Murder, it was only one, but we do tend to average about one per year. And that is the commitment of resources that we're measuring in weeks not in hours. That's the bulk of the detective division all night long, right outside the door, all day long, all day long, all day long, all day long for days and weeks and months that followed. Accidents, fatal, injury, property evading, 1, 154, 510, 139. 391 protective custody incidents. Those are situations where an individual presents a danger to themselves or someone else and they need voluntarily involuntarily to go to the hospital for care. Sexual assaults, one per week, 42. Narcan saves, and I, I've joked with you about this before, I can be both very excited. We had 42 Narcans, 43 Narcan saves. I can be very scared. We had 43 Narcan saves, and I feel that delivering it with both effect is appropriate. Opioid overdose deaths, seven. Narcotics investigations, 117. Against that backdrop, 6,337 motor vehicle stops in the course of the calendar year, 17.36 motor vehicle stops per day. I do not in any way begrudge the very legitimate feeling of residents in town. Um, that say they drive too fast on my road because I believe that they do drive too fast on that road and unfortunately on that road and unfortunately on your road and my road and seemingly on every road. But I do not want to uh, leave the impression, not that anyone has, has intimated this, but I don't want to leave the impression that the officers are not engaging in motor vehicle enforcement or it's not seen as a priority. 6,337 motor vehicle stops, 17.36 per day. And you've seen this list before, but I am trying to offer to you by showing to you in the very small font and in the multiple slides, the fact that we are at last count up to 63 requested locations for motor vehicle enforcement. The phrase that I used, I used it earlier, speaking to a, a fellow attendee here tonight, um, and I'm not proud of this, but it's the nature of what we do. This is to some degree the whack-a-mole game. 
And every place that an officer is, is some place that an officer is not. And um, I mean, that's, that's a concept that we proudly call police omnipresence, but we do have to appreciate and understand that if they are on Elm Street, they're not on Booth. And if they are on Mullen, they're not in front of, they're not in front of 57 Simon. You were specifically asked about, and I had the pleasure of speaking to the gentleman a few moments ago, came over and introduced himself, it was great to meet him, about the Abbey Road concerns, past and present. Um, I would share with you with a quiet degree of pride that we had 47 motor vehicle stops on Abbey Road in 2022. A specific complaint was received as to Abbey Road in August of 2022, and 30 of those 47 traffic stops were conducted after that complaint was received. So there was a level of department responsiveness even last year to this. Thereafter, the assets do move to focus on other locations. Additionally, we did put the speed trailer out on Abbey Road from July 18th to August 1st, and then um, as a result of additional instructions that I gave to my folks, because Abbey Road is obviously a source of concern, we have had another um, 20 traffic stops between January 12th and January 20th. It is my intention to shift one officer from the patrol division into the traffic division in March of this year. This is this game. I would be more than happy and frankly do think this is the province of the council if it was your direction to uh, take your input as to where resources were directed. But I also operate, and I, I take this quite seriously, operate in an effort to be responsive to my budget and the overtime impact that it has when I move an officer from patrol into the traffic division. The traffic division has one supervisor assigned to it and three officers. Their primary responsibility throughout the course of the day is to take the crashes, the property crashes, the injury crashes, the fatal crashes. When they are not engaged in that activity, they are my traffic enforcement ex uh, experts. As we are approaching full staffing, we were there briefly, as we approach and, and hopefully return to full staffing, I can have a little more flexibility in terms of my personnel allotment. It's my intention to move one additional officer from patrol to traffic in March of this year and leave that person there. I would be more than happy to do more than that, but I also recognize that I have a fiscal responsibility to the community and to all of you to ensure that my numbers and the overtime ledger don't go up unreasonably. This will allow a little bit more flexibility in that area. Finally tonight, I was asked, slightly divorced from the discussion about motor vehicle enforcement, to spend at least a few minutes offering you the insights, whatever insights that I can, as to wrong way driving concerns. This has obviously been a significant public concern. We've seen a great deal of attention. We've seen um, fatalities. We've seen heartbreak, uh, certainly in this area. We know that wrong way drivers typically fall, almost always fall into one of three categories. They're lost they're elderly, or they are intoxicated. There are a couple of intersections. We do not have them in town, I'm pleased to report, where individuals can go to turn into what they think is the entrance to a highway, and the exit is literally right next to there. There are places where one would think they're going onto a side street, and all of a sudden they find out that they've erroneously turned into the wrong direction on a highway. We do not have such locations in Enfield. In the broader picture, lost, elderly, or intoxicated. What we do have in Enfield is a notable piece of I-91 that is very far removed from Hartford and the state police out of Hartford take responsibility for our highways. We routinely assist the state police with crashes on the highway and we would, in time of crisis, such as a wrong way driver, very likely be the first, very close to the first resource to get up on the highway to try to help with that wrong way driver. There are no easy answers here. Having spent 24 years wearing that uniform, I can tell you what we don't do. We certainly don't get on the highway and travel in the wrong direction in an effort to catch up to the wrong way driver. That would seriously only compound the problem. So what we do is we try to get in the proper travel lane and try to get that person's attention with lights, blaring the siren, whatever we can to try to redirect that person, and sometimes it works. There have been instances where a trooper simply through happenstance has been going the right way 
as they've been coming toward the wrong way driver. And with his permission, I, I share with you, because I otherwise wouldn't speak out of school, that is the reason that Mr. Steve Hall, who works for me, left the state police on a disability pension, because this situation is frankly a game of chicken. And with the lights activated and the wigwags flashing and a siren on, sometimes that's enough to deter that individual, be they lost, elderly, or intoxicated, and they reroute. And sometimes they do not. There are no good answers here. We are, in fact, seeing an increase. There are some larger technical DOT solutions. Um, none of them are a panacea. They are all perhaps just thoughts um, that, are, that, are, that are out there for the world's consideration. Variable message boards are in place in very populated cities, populated locations, but you have to see the message board in time, and then you have to have time to get to the side of the road or an exit to get off the highway for the variable message board to have value. Improved signage, markings, flashing lights, and rumble strips. You may have heard about this. Basically, on a radar or a laser beam, if somebody started driving the wrong way on an exit ramp, the beam would somehow detect that, and the lights would start flashing to try to catch that person's attention. There are, in some jurisdictions, but I don't know that it would work up north, wrong way spike strips. Think about, think about the rental car lot. Do not back up, or your tires will be shredded. The problem with those in this climate is they're not going to work with plows, and even if they were going to work, invariably we would have someone making a claim for damage to tires. Highway sensing, highway sensors leading to a real-time monitoring system has also been part of the discussion. No easy answers, but it certainly is my pleasure to give you whatever guidance I can in terms of that as an issue and the potential big-picture solutions that are out there. As always, I'm more than happy to address any concerns, questions, or comments as to either the motor vehicle enforcement discussion or the wrong way driving, if I can be of any assistance. Councilor Finger. <clears throat> Finger. Did you want to go, Cindy? Go ahead. Thank you, Chief. Um, sir. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you, sir. Um, I, for one, would never question a way that your officers do their jobs. I think that, as rated, we do have the number one police department in the state, and I appreciate everything that you and your officers do. Thank you. You guys are fantastic. Um, I do know that a few weeks ago at the transfer station, we lost power because the tree fell over the power lines. You had an officer sit there for six and a half hours because he couldn't leave because of the liability to the town of Enfield, then was replaced for another two and a half hours as we left that day. So I do know that your hands are tied on a lot of things. That officer could have been doing maybe the Abbey Road check or somewhere else, but now they get pulled off to go somewhere else. People don't realize that they're just not sitting inside Elm Street waiting for a call. These, these, these officers are out there doing their jobs, and I just want to say thank you very much for what you do. I thank you. I appreciate that. The patrol officers generally are going call to call to call, and when they're not on one, they're often assisting a coworker because the domestic or the drunk driver or the robber are not one-person calls. Thank you. Councilor Mangini. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Yes, ma'am. Uh, again, wonderful uh, presentation. The data is right on, and we appreciate that. <clears throat> what concerns me, though, is that you're going to take an officer from patrol, put him on traffic. We have budget coming up, ha and again, we don't have a window into what is coming forward, but hopefully you're going to be putting a request in your budget to satisfy your needs because I know I speak on behalf of the council and the public. We want to make sure our PD is fully, um, not only staffed, but able you know, to handle whatever situations. We don't want to tie your hands behind your back. I very much appreciate that as well. I certainly would be, uh, I'd be very happy to have the discussion with an understanding that I recognize, with a sincere understanding that I recognize that all of you have got to balance the books come budget time as well. And uh, I mean, the more resources that are available, the more I can deploy into hot spots and areas of concern. Um, but I, I certainly appreciate that and uh, would, would welcome that discussion if that was a, a council direction, a council priority. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Chief, I always meant to ask about Crest 
activation. So how does that work? I mean, I'm sure it's a point of pride to be able to assist with something in another community. Does the state reimburse us for that? What does that look like in terms so, of funding? So they do not reimburse us. Crest is, Crest is the Capital Region Emergency Services Team. And if you can envision, uh, effectively, it's the greater Hartford County area, certainly as far north as us, as far south as Middletown, Cromwell, that area, uh, departments that aren't large enough to have the commitment, uh, nor, nor am I asking for this, the commitment of personnel, resources, and equipment to field their own tactical teams, uh, regionalize this as a, as, a, as a commitment. And there are times where we lose town resources when they go to Coventry to assist Coventry with an armed barricaded subject. But I get the Coventry officers and the Weathersfield officers and the East Hartford and the Manchester officers to come to town when we have the high-risk search warrant, when we have the barricaded subject, when we have the shots fired calls for service. So no, it is, uh, it is, it is effectively the ultimate in a mutual aid, if you will, as part of a standing protocol. Uh, there is a great deal of pride and a great deal of expertise in the Crest team members that I also think they're able to impart, at least on a micro level, to other members of the organization. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Ludwig. Chief, how are you doing? Thank you, sir. Thanks I'm very well. Here. Thank you. Two questions. So I think the nature, again, the nature of traffic, uh, you know, is kind of whack-a-mole, right? So do we do sort of, like, again, you get complaints in a certain part of town. Do we do certain, okay, you know what, we're going to take some folks, not that you need to do overtime, but a knock on wood, maybe there's not a lot of other things going on. So you do a special trap or you, whatever it may be, or you just put a car there. Do we do that regularly without needing overtime? I, I would assume we do. We do. It's that This is not an overtime assignment. Right. I mean, if I happen to have... Yeah, if I happen to have something that would fit, you know, a click it or ticket grant, a DUI grant, right. I could certainly I could meld a couple of worlds together. But most of the complaints that we hear at uh, passing school buses, stop sign violations, speeding violations, those are being done on straight time with either traffic personnel or patrol personnel. And the reason why I ask, so I'm going to do a little psychological experiment here. When you put that that whatever it is, the electronic thing, you know, that says you're going 45 miles an hour and everyone slows down, right? Everyone says that's one of the most effective traffic, you know, calmer. So my, so my question is if, if you guys were doing North Main Street tonight and your people are flying by and you get, do you then follow up saying, look, on our website, look, by the way, we want to let you know we are out there. And we, we go all over town. There's no set schedule. And we, re, we gave 25 tickets tonight because folks didn't want to stop and, you know, went flying. You know, if that follow-up, because I'm telling you, that's as effective as having an officer at every single corner in town. Once you, hey, look, they are out there. And maybe they're not on my street tonight. Sure. But they certainly could be because sure. it's part. You know, I mean, is that part of that? Because I don't know if we do that. So it's a yes and no. On the first part, yes. On the second part, you raise a good point. Uh, when we take a complaint, um, especially if it's more than a, especially if it's more than a one-off, especially right. if it's more than a hey, when you get a chance, the traffic sergeant is assigned to actually study that road, and that involves putting the speed trailer up, which captures the speeds. He then is able to calculate out what we figure the 85th percentile speed is to figure out, you know, really. Uh, is it a perception issue? Is it in fact? Uh, is it in fact an area? What's the average speed in that area? So that part always takes place. Um, certainly, a uh, a renewed emphasis or a push for on this day, this many traffic stops occurred. That's uh, that's that's a sound suggestion. I'm telling you, if, when we do, I, I'm just telling you from my own experience. When we have someone near a stop sign, it is historically no one sort of stops. I can tell you, I get calls on it. Yep. Hey, the officer's over there, then they're, they're giving tickets on, whatever it may be. I'm telling you, it's effective. Mm. And it doesn't cost us a dime to do it. So I'm just saying something to think about, just fair. a suggestion. Yep, fair. And again, this is something, I, I don't know why those traffic strips, I'm sorry, they're a waste, in my opinion. But if we did a dip, or we did what Windsor does in the nice, big, whatever they call it, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, um, speed, speed bump. Speed bump. They work in, you go to Windsor, you go flying over that speed bump, your cars, you're, you're stopped. If we could do that in between Monroe and Coolidge on Abbey Road, where that, that is the most dangerous section in town. I stood there I, with, a, with a mother and I saw that car come flying. I gotta tell you, I got white because I was scared to death. If we put 
again, invest in some of the money and put it there as a pilot program. If it doesn't work, we pull it out. Because I know there's other sections. We've talked about this for 40 years. I mean, back when I was on a council in the 90s. People, oh, you can't do it because it hurts emergency vehicles, blah, blah, blah. But other towns have done it. And they seem pretty And I'm not talking about a rotary. You don't need to spend all that kind of money on a rotary. But if we put the dips and you're flying down Abbey Road and you hit a dip, because you know if you've ever been on the highway and there's a little bit of snow and you decide, you know what, I don't want to go slow on 91. I'm going to go over to the HOV lane. And you hit that dip. Guess what happens to your car? You ain't going anywhere. I, I'm not adverse to that. I mean, I, I was asked to present and did present, uh, you know, a more formal traffic calming position paper, uh, and we presented that. But certainly these other options are at, are at your it. level. I, I don't know if it goes through you. It's through our budget a bit something we should consider as a pilot. If it doesn't work, so be it. But I, for me, the excuse that it, it's – I'm sorry. I think it's an excuse, and you can disagree. I'm not saying this to you, but I've heard, oh, you, you, the fire trucks can't go over, the plows can't go over it. Well, again, they know going to that section we have speed bumps or a dip. They're going to go slow. And, you know, I'm sure the people who live there, hey, if those folks are going slow, everyone's going slow. I, 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 uh, I hear what you're saying. I defer to the council on that again, one. Great That's presentation. Not, I appreciate you. your answer because I think, again, if we let people know, hey, we were in – we don't have to even be specific. We were in the Brainerd Road area. And, oh, by the way, we just want to let people know we issued 26 speeding tickets. So we, we're listening to what you're telling us. Mm -hmm. I think it would be very effective. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Appreciate yes, it. Thank you. Councillor Nelson. Thank you, Chief. Great presentation. Thank you, sir. Um, one thing that I think um, you should have touched on is you have 100 sworn officers. Correct. Are you still currently at full roster? No. No. We've already had one retire out. We had, uh, well, one's retirement will take effect on 131. There was one uh, unexpected separation from service. Um, and I don't want to go too far off script, but I, you know, there are at least a couple of others that are exploring options. And I, that, to some degree, that's the nature of what we do. But the short answer to your question is no, we are not at 100 any longer. Right. So and that's not counting vacations, family leave, officers that are set up to retire the drop plan in the future. Um, so to say we're at 100 full time officers, even having 100 full on the roster, at any given time, you could be down to 90 or 85 sworn officers because they're out long-term disability and other things. Um, we all want traffic calming, and we want to take care of the residents throughout town. And I think he's saying loud and clear, it's up to us. And I know we used to have two officers in the pipeline that we would hire we would send them to the academy so when we an officer retired or somebody was out for long-term disability, we had officers to put on the street to take that spot. He can't fill these positions with people that aren't there. So I don't know what happened to those two positions, but they don't exist anymore. Um, it was just so he can hire them today. It takes a year to get them on the street. And he made one, I don't even know if it was a week, with 100 full-time <laughs> officers. And we're already gone from it. So in a year from now, the changes are astronomical. You look at further in the agenda, his, his um, fit up, to fit up all the new officers this year alone is crazy. So um, I'm willing to put... Um, my money where my mouth is or the taxpayer's money and add those two positions back because you know long-term disability or familiarity leave those officers i don't believe are getting paid to be out that long from your payroll well it depends it depends on what they're on i mean a workers comp situation the insurance carrier becomes involved military leave that's a there's a formula mm -hmm. uh, family leave um, if somebody who's pregnant, somebody who's injured, uh, there would be variables in each one of those situations. Right. But the point is we could be using some of the um, salary from those positions to cover the cost of these two other positions. And then, um, you know, they become full time officers and it's somebody retires out and it's he's still at 100, even though his count is 102. So I think we really should consider that at budget time. It used to be here. It was a great plan for him to help um, foresee officers that are retiring and help them get up to speed quicker. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. OK, thank you. Councillor Ungar. Hi, Chief. Nice to see you. Thank you, ma'am. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming in and continuing this conversation from our public safety meeting. Um, during our, I think it was a couple meetings ago, we received a handout with all the 
traffic calming scenarios that we could possibly use. Um, do we still have that available? Perhaps we could email it to everyone. I'd, I'd certainly so be more than happy to provide it, uh, provide it again. I think it would be good for everyone to see it and read the suggestions. My pleasure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Despard, Mr. Mayor. Chief, uh, thanks. Great presentation. Thank you, sir. This is, um, as uh, Councilwoman Ungar said, we went over this in public safety. I was relieved to see you'd be here. I didn't want to have to recap that all. Um, and then I also did want to say, <laughs> I do, um, I share your two feelings on the, the Narcan saves. I mean, how incredible that you guys have saved 42 lives and yet how terrible that you've had to. And so I know that as a council, this is something we want to be talking about more. And I think we have some things in the works to, to um, sort of highlight that crisis. And, and I know that, um, you know, you'll be right along there with us. So thanks again. Thank you. And I, when, I, when I speak on it, I, I actually deliver it just that way because I think the point is made when you describe it with both affects. Okay. Th thank you, Chief. Uh, I just have just a couple of yes, sir. quick comments. Thank you for all of your statistics that you uh, gave to everybody in regard to the traffic issues that we do have here in town. And yes, sir. I think it's an eye-opening experience for the data that you showed, 63 areas in town that we're actually patrolling and taking care of. Um, fiscally and, and looking at, uh, you know, some suggestions that, that we've had, you know, in regards to, you know, possible speed bumps in certain areas of town, I think we also have to start looking at, and I know it's cost, but a lot of towns are doing it, especially in high volume areas with these uh, roundabouts and rotaries. And you want to talk about slowing down traffic? There, there's an, an example there. I just want to just touch base a little on uh, wrong, wrong way drivers. I know that the um, Connecticut State Department of Transportation has a program out there now that they're examining different areas of town uh, on and off ramps that you were suggesting. Um, and I know that there, and I think Enfield, uh, there's, I think there's four areas off, I think of 46 and 48. Uh, I don't know if you've been in contact or they've been in contact with your department yet, but there are specific areas there on those particular exits and also on uh, 190, uh, obviously Hazard Ave and 220. Uh, there's a couple of different sections there that, that people go the wrong way. And I think that their, their program is putting um, on pavement to say wrong way. So if somebody turns when it's dark out and they see their headlights and they, they see this, the, uh, that something's gonna be in the road. Mm -hmm. So uh, as long as the state of Connecticut has been in, I hopefully uh, been in contact, but I know um, they will be because uh, that there is a program that that is out there very uh, good. In, in regard to that very good 48 is one of the areas of, if i was if i was getting to pick the 48 exchange area it's just it's tight and there's a lot going on there right and um, i think that would be uh, certainly at the top of my list as well correct thank you but thank thank you very much thank you, sir. Uh, uh, this is uh, definitely worthwhile for everybody to hear all the st statistics because we, have, we do have people that come up here and sometimes um, give their own statistics. And uh, so thank you uh, for telling us. I certainly understand their concerns. Uh, it's a perception reality. I'm happy to help. Correct. Thank you very much. Okay, Councilor Ludwig. The, 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 one, the wrong way, I'm curious, we don't get any state cops help up here, right, for the highway if it's all on the infield police, is that correct? The highway is a state police jurisdiction, so it is all theirs. Having said that, um, the, I, the, the, I never see a. I'm sorry, I never see a state cop up here. So the state police patrol structure, out of Troop H, and frankly, out of any other troops that are centered around a big city, is that it seems like the resources fold in on the most densely populated area. In this case, Hartford, with regularity. So when the individuals uh, that are assigned, when, when the trooper who's assigned the tunnel on 84 takes a crash, that individual, he or she is tied up. So when one comes in at the 91 interchange, the nearest patrol comes and covers that. And what you see, what I lived, was the resources tend to do this around the greater Hartford area. So you might have the Manchester patrol, right. but all of a sudden you're in East Hartford because these Hartford guys in Hartford. What this causes, this cascade, if you will, is that we 
from a mutual aid perspective, with a quiet sense of pride, are up on the highway with some regularity to provide assistance. Once the state gets there for the crash, for the serious injury accident, for the fatal, for anything else, it does belong to them. But you're the, we're most likely the initial responder. We are very, very often the I first person the up there. I think that's what most people don't understand, and that's a key point. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, next public communications. Uh, any person wishing to speak in front of the council tonight, please state your name and address for the record. And a reminder, you're going to have five minutes uh, for this round, and we ask that you uh, everybody be professional and refrain from personnel matters. Um, Scott? Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll start by saying Scott Bertrand, uh, Enfield Housing Authority, one Pearson Way. Chief Fox, you're a tough act to follow when I came to actually speak to the council very briefly on garbage. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Actually, my reason for coming tonight was just that, to ask the council to consider tabling item F. Um, I did have the opportunity quite a few times over the weekend to have several in-depth conversations with our town manager. Um, I, I do feel that uh, there's some information that, that might have been missing and that uh, if given the opportunity to work directly with the town manager, we could really um, come to a conclusion that's going to make everybody happy and put, these, uh, put this issue, issue to bed. That was my reason for coming. Um, it seems like you guys got already got addressed, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to come in front of the council? Good evening, Gary Young, Abbey Road. <clears throat> Excellent presentation tonight. So Chief Fox, thank you very much for your time. Uh, tonight I'd like to thank Council Member Gina Sakala and Mayor Crisati specifically for reaching out to me a couple weeks ago and updating me on my concerns about the traffic safety issues in town and specifically on an identified area in Abbey Road. The police department's traffic enforcement presence was undoubtedly noticed not only on Abbey Road, but other areas in town this past weekend. So thank you to the chief as well for trying to address these concerns. And as mentioned, I'm also grateful for the presentation tonight. I wasn't expecting a presentation tonight, but when I saw on the agenda that the chief was going to be here tonight on Friday, uh, I made a point to change my schedule to be here. So I have been here a few times since the past August. I've raised concerns about the traffic safety in general, especially in a specific section of Abbey Road. So I wanted to take the time to recognize the positive since I had been raising concerns and complained the last two visits. So there is the other side of me. I do understand this is not an overnight fix, but again, thank you for the efforts and more specifically the details that were shared tonight. Overall, the goal of being proactive rather than reactive is never met with celebration, especially when potentially receiving a ticket is the outcome, but it is a wake-up call. I've certainly become more aware of my own driving habits since last August when I raised the concern initially. As a community, we do need to become more vigilant of our driving habits and realize our younger generation is watching how we drive and should not think what we are doing is okay. More and more young people, unfortunately, are being killed in these traffic-related events, and it's actually up 5% specifically for bike-related and pedestrian-related uh, based on the National Highway uh, Traffic Association facts for 21-22. We should now have to wait for an unfortunate event. To the concern tonight specifically, and I had to change things up a bit, regarding, regarding traffic calming. As mentioned in a recent response to the council members, I would be open to any options and thoughts regarding this specific area of Abbey Road that was mentioned, including but not limited to speed, uh, solar speed signs and changing to a brighter, more noticeable speed limit sign in some of those areas. I have noticed this recently happening in other towns neighboring, and it might be something that we consider, which might also help with uh, Chief Fox's concerns of staffing. I totally understand you can't be in all places at the same time, but awareness as Mr. Ludwig had presented tonight, that might actually help. 
The other item, which is more of a long-term goal, would be getting that sidewalk installation back on the PAR report. I cannot, for some reason, figure out where and how it got pulled off, but that stretch of Abbey Road was initially slated for Abbey Road um, sidewalk to be added, and I can't figure out what happened. Um, and the only other thing, real quickly now, uh, July 4th safety flyer. Narcan and traffic awareness. Maybe there's something as simple as a flyer that's added to our upcoming July 4th event, and that might uh, help awareness as well. And then the only other thing regarding uh, wrong way concern that I've noticed myself, I saw it firsthand, as crazy as it seems, um, Route 5 West, trying to get onto 91 North, two people at that left-hand light were taking a left and actually started to get onto the exit ramp from 91 South, or 91 North. So I guess you don't realize how bad it is until you see it firsthand and you're having kind of heart failure when you see these two cars and they actually took the left one lane before the, uh, the on-ramp. So that's it. Thanks for listening to okay. me. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that would like to come in front of the council? Hearing none. Oh, yes. Okay. <coughs> Good evening, my name is Ronke Stallings of 22 Middle Road in Enfield. And in this first month of the new year, I'm taking a stand and refusing to continue to suffer in silence any longer. My family and I have been being bullied by Town of Enfield staff since 2016. That's right, seven years. The term is correct as the definition of bullying is a person or persons who habitually seeks to harm or intimidate those whom are vulnerable. And the acts of Karen Edelson. Excuse me. Excuse me. Let's move the mic closer, yeah. Sorry. No, no, thank you. It gives me a moment to catch my breath. Do I need to start over or? The term is correct as the definition of bullying is a person or persons who habitually seeks to harm or intimidate those who are vulnerable. And the acts of Karen Edelson, now the Senior Operations Manager for Social Services, Lisa Zosiak, the accounting clerk, Dawn Homer, who's the former Director of Social Services, and Chad Kowitsky, the former town manager, continue to have a stomach-turning effect on my family personally and privately and professionally. From 2012 to 2016, my husband and I enrolled three children. Hmm? Speak up. My husband and I enrolled three children into the Child Children's ECDC, the Enfield Child Development Program, Infant Toddler Program here in Enfield. Our first born in 2012, our second born in 2015, and her third child in 2016. For each child enrolled, we provided an extensive application which included health verifications, residency verifications, and financial verifications to both Karen and Lisa. Both encouraged us to apply for the sliding scale fee program and advised that we would qualify as we met the income qualifications for our family size. Since 2012, we have made every payment, every week, never missing a single payment. And I know as parents, people know how difficult it is to try and have a work-life balance and pay for child care services as is very expensive. We be in the program through many location changes from South Street to Enfield Street and finally at Post Office Road. We would converse with fellow parents of ECDC kids at Little League games, town functions, Costco, or Kohl's where we would compare notes on the program's happenings it was during these conversations where I would find out that in 2015, Karen Edelson and Lisa Zosiak were both privately investigated and put on administrative leave for five days without pay for questionable and inconsistent accounting practices. Human Resources Director at the time, Stephen Bilendia, 
and her union rep would all agree, and I quote, in the in interest to forego a long and formal discipline process, all parties would agree to a five-day suspension without pay. A settlement investigation that cited tuition fees and past due balances being waived for participants, excuse me, for certain participants for the years, prorated tuitions for certain participants throughout the years, and in some cases, completely wiping out the past balances due to, express, due to partners, excuse me, due to participants who express hardships in the program. In November 2016, as I picked my youngest son from the program, I received a notice in his diaper bag citing that at the end of the week, which was in three days, my family and I would have to pay $13,000 in order to keep my children in the program. Startled by this notice, we quickly, quickly attempted to reach out for clarification and chose to include the town manager, Brian, at the time. And again, with no resolve, Karen would stand in the doorways as I continued to drop my kids off each day following me around the building as I dropped three children to three separate classrooms as if I was some kind of a criminal based on the false allegations and calculations of her and Lisa Zosiak. For the past seven years, I have suffered in silence. But you know what? I said no more. It is January of 2023. I have never taken anything from anyone. My husband and I work extremely hard for everything we have and we have never manipulated any financial funding in any way, shape, or form. So for my family to be publicly ridiculed by two female staff members who are on record for fraudulent acts, who continue to sign affidavits with fraudulent acts against my family is immoral and is wrong. I stand in front of you today because honestly, I'm tired. I'm tired. I've been fighting allegations that are not true. Thank you. And that are false by two members who have the privilege of being addressed and punished for the egregious acts privately. But yet, my family's name gets to be tarnished publicly for stuff that we did not do, nor partake in. So I come to the council today, pleading in this new year to please give me peace. Please look into what I'm saying. It's all there. I'm not making any of this up. It's in the journal inquire of all the egregious acts. It's in the public records to the point where we're going to go to court on Wednesday. And the judge cited the documentation is so all over the place, we're not even sure who owes who. But at the same time, my family is the one. Stallings versus the town of Enfield. Town of Enfield versus the Stallings. It's not fair. We are the town of Enfield, and we did nothing wrong. But yet, our name is being disgraced publicly as being versus the town of Enfield. The town. The town should stand up for us because we've done nothing wrong. And, and I'm sorry that I'm emotional, but I'm tired. I'm tired of being prosecuted by two people who get to sit in their positions and ab abuse town funds. But this time, it's not funds of the ECDC, it's town of Enfield, because you guys were able to secure attorneys. I don't have money. I don't have $450 an hour. I don't have a $5,000 retaining fee. I don't have it. So therefore, my husband and I have been working on these cases ourselves, writing up information against an attorney who actually is his job to understand and prosecute people and understand legal language. I don't know. So I'm coming before you today to say, please, all I ask is, can somebody please look into what I'm saying? And if what I'm saying is true, please stop Karen and Lisa from attacking my family, because again, I'm tired. I thank you for your okay. time. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to come in front of the council? Second time. Public communications. I declare public 
communications over. Councillor communications. Are there any councillor communications? Councillor Franger. Sure, thanks. Um, like so many people, I think up here, I was able to attend the JFK dedication and walk through on Thursday the 12th. Um, the building's beautiful if you haven't been into it. It's high tech, state of the art, clean. The seats work, the bathrooms work. It's kind of amazing. Um, I'd like to thank the building committee and all of their hard work over the many years um, that they have dedicated their volunteer hours after hours um, to making this happen. I'm excited to now have a middle school that is as good, if not better, than the brand new high school we have as well. Um, I hope people took an opportunity to walk through, um, through the guided tours, to see the building because it is, is quite remarkable. Um, and you were able to kind of see what our tax dollars paid for. So to be able to see that reward um, and the result of the money that we put in. I know that school referendums aren't always popular. Referendums aren't always popular with all the residents, but I'm a firm believer of investing in our schools, investing in our buildings, and investing in our infrastructure. So having a state-of-the-art schools and a good school system um, attracts new families to our town, and that's super important. Um, we've done our high school, we've done our middle school, and I'm excited um, to see what's next because I, I don't think we're done yet. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Councilor Finger. Thank you, Mayor. A couple of things. Um, one is this last week we lost another DPW employee, uh, Ronald Smith. Um, uh, found deceased in his home. Um, I don't know what 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 happened, but um, Ronnie was a forty one year forty one year employee to town of Enfield. And those of you who are in the council, when we started recycling here, he was the spokesperson. He was that guy on that big life size banner holding a recycling can, and because of him and at the time the crew leader Paul Kelly and Dave Tuttle was uh, was the supervisor then they helped get this town on track for the recycling and Ronnie was a big push because not only, not only did they come here in front of the council Ronnie and those guys went to each school and started the recycling programs of the school so he was the um, I won't say father of it but you know he was the big brother of it and and Ronnie, he went through some tough times here in town, um, but he he survived a good forty one years, um, and he was everybody's friend, everybody's friend. Uh, there wasn't a hate bone in his body. He he made everybody laugh. I made everybody smile, and um, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that. You know, we're, this is three people within a year that we've lost in the DPW. And and it's a shame. And it's tough on a lot of us who've known for people for all these years. And the young people need to know that, that you have to make the best you can in life because you may not always be around, but well, you won't be around forever, but do the best you can. Do what you can to make things right. Um, don't have any hate bones in your body. And... Um, make life the best you can because that's what ronnie did for everybody he walked in through the door and he smiled and he, at the end of the day he'd be smiling a lot of people loved him including myself um his wake is the visiting hours is this wednesday at browns from four to seven in case anybody's interested in attending uh, it'd be a great honor if we could show up um, with some people from there that's the first thing. Second thing is I do would like to see, I don't know what we are liable for as a council with what this young lady just came up and spoke her and her husband, uh, but we do need to know if there is anything that we can do or can't do. If our hands are tied as a council, because it is, if she, she did mention she's going to court, so obviously we have no, it's a court hearing, so we really have no, no grip to help you at this point, I'm sorry, at this point. So, but hang in there, be tough, and uh, be the strong woman that you are, including with your husband, uh, being a strong man that he is. And um, I hope everything works out for you. Thank you. Councilor Nelson. Um, along with Councilman Finger, um, to the Stalling family, if it is pending litigation, we cannot comment 
do to the charter. But what I can do for you, because I'm new up here, maybe other counselors know about this, I know nothing about it, is I can make a motion that we go to executive session after this meeting because she needs help now and I need an update on exactly what's going on here from town staff. And if it's pending litigation, we can discuss it in executive session to get us up to speed. Because if we can do something, and I don't want to make any comments because I don't know the case, but that is the best I can do for you to bring it to light tonight. I can't do anything more publicly for you. So I have a motion on a table. We go to executive session just to discuss this case and get us up to speed tonight. And find out where it's going and what we can do. I'll second it. Uh, I, I want to defer to our town attorney. Yeah. Well, just, just as a point of clarification, my office is not handling this case. It has been transferred. It's been farmed out to a, a collections attorney. Uh, it's Green, uh, law offices of Gary Green out of uh, Farmington. They're handling the case. We are not. I, I, I understand that, but <clears throat> she brought up employee issues and stuff like that, and um, people being suspended for five days. I think the council has a right to know uh, the merit of these accusations and, you know, get up to speed with what's going on. I personally have several grandchildren in the school, and, you know, our community is very much involved. And, you know, there's some strong accusations here. And I think we should be brought up to speed on what's going on there the best you can under this short notice yeah you can comment on the motion councillor Mangini. thank you i just want to make a brief comment on the motion uh thank you councillor nelson for bringing that thought forward i will not support going into executive session and the reason is that this again is the first time I've learned of this situation. It's an unfortunate, horrible situation, it sounds like. But the minute we as a council step into um, even executive session, that could expose our town to litigation. Again, I don't know. I'm not the attorney. But I'm very hesitant about um, putting our town in a, a more grievous situation, as well as the defendants um, that could compromise their uh, position in court as well. So I, I really, you know, am, am concerned about um, o overstepping our authority and our boundaries as a council. So I, I'm not good for that. Thank you. Councilor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I really appreciate the family coming in and talking about this. I would also like to know more about it, but I think, I mean, and one point of clarification here, is your request for um, for an executive session right now or for the end of the meeting. Uh, personally, I would not prefer executive session now. I think I want a comprehensive update on this, and I don't know if we have the ability to do that tonight. Um, I think that can be done this week, probably. I don't want to speak for the town managers, but um, I, don't, I wouldn't support that. So he's asking me a okay. question. Can I address him? Just, just hold on one second. I just want to go through this here. Uh, I, I just want to remind everyone, if we are going to talk about an employee in a, uh, an executive session, this person has a right to be there to defend themselves. And I'm not sure I can ever Correct. that. Well, uh, I will, uh, Councillor uh, Santanella, then we're going to vote on the uh, motion. Yeah. I, I guess my question is to the town manager. Can, yeah. can you shed some light on this to the extent that w would you be prepared to have a thorough conversation or... They they personally, no. No, yeah, so I, I none think of us are. And I, we can't do something without noticing an yep. employee. And you also, if you're going to do a vote to go into executive session, it needs to be two-thirds vote, which means you would need eight votes in order to pass the motion. Okay. I, I, can I just make one ahead. more comment? Yeah. So uh, very sympathetic to Councillor Nelson's desire to get some clarification. But if we, we don't have the resources to do this right now, I don't see any reason to try to go to executive session. This is very spur of the moment. It doesn't seem like we would be productive at this moment, but we should seek to sort of get some clarification for this as quickly as possible. I think we, we all would like to hear that. So thank you. I, I just want to make a comment. We, we can vote 
vote on this. I don't even know if it's necessary to vote due to the fact that we do not have enough information thrown upon this. This has gone back to 2012, I believe. And we're not, we don't have enough information right now. We can get some information so that they can, you know, inform us properly as to what what is going on with the situation. But in terms of uh, going into executive session without any information, I just don't think it uh, would be necessary. Okay. Well, um, but I think we. It, it's we, been going on since 2012. You're correct, and I'm not aware of one council member sitting up here that's aware of it. And we should, as a council, know pending litigation that's going on in this town. We used to be updated in executive session on all pending litigation that's going on. Here is a family crying to us for help. It isn't spur of the moment. They've been dealing with it since 2012. And we can't take five minutes to get up to speed in executive session and follow procedure and direct them that we either call a special meeting and try to help these people because they don't have time. We have all the time in the world. I understand what you guys are saying. They're unprepared, but they've had since 2012. And it's not Ellen's fault because she wasn't here to update this council. And what's it going to take to get an update? There's a motion on the floor, and it's seconded. So, yes, I okay, would like we, it to go to a vote. We will we will vote. Okay. But before we vote, I, I understand what you're saying, Ken, but it sounds like it may just be a collections matter on our side. And if that is true, we don't get updates in executive session necessarily on all those if collection matters. If it's going matters. to court. Collection matters collections. do go to court, and that's not necessarily something this, this council okay. does get general updates on because we have a collection law office that deals with that so anyway that's okay we, we neither will, here nor there but we, we will vote. vote on the motion to go into executive session thank you mr you're Mayor. welcome okay sheila councillor mangini against councillor nelson for councillor pisner for councillor santanella against councillor ungeyer for Deputy Mayor Sakala against Mayor Crisati against Councillor Despard against Councillor Finger for Councillor Hopkins against Councillor Ludwig for that is excuse me two, three, four. four members four and um, seven against four uh, five sorry Three, four, correction, five, four, sorry. Six against, five, four. Wait a minute. What are we doing, Charity? What, what's going on? So just a, just a point of order. Excuse me. Excuse me. We're... Um, no back and forth. Come on. No back me, and Matt. forth. Okay. So Excuse me. Shush. Excuse me. Point, point of order, everyone. We can really no. do whatever they want. No. All right. As a point of order, yeah. I don't think there's any rule against councilors leaving the dais. I mean, this was an issue that was brought. Uh, pardon me, I, I do have the floor. I've raised a point of order. Point of order is I think the, the meeting should continue. I think we can all get updates for this later, but let's not make a show of this. It's an important thing. By leaving the dais, there's no rule against that. So, point of order, I would like the meeting to continue. Thank you. Point of order, he should recuse we, himself. We, 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 will, we, we will move forward with the vote. It's, could you please just state the results and we will move forward with councilor communications. I have five in favor of going into executive session and six against. Okay, thank you. Is there any other councilor communications? Councilor Desperate. I just wanted to clarify, um, you know, I, when they stated their um, address, um, they're in my district. And so I just wanted to give them my contact information. I didn't know that that was a, a big issue. But that's what I did. I gave them my uh, made-up business card. Okay, Councillor Mangini. Just um, back on Councillor Communications, several of us did attend the Opera House Players Open House, which was very incitive. Um, it's good to see that we are uh, supporting the arts. They are moving forward, and they've got some great shows coming up for us. Thank you. Are there any other Councillor Communications? Councillor Ungar. As Gina, uh, Councillor Sakala stated that JFK had their grand opening ceremonies and that was a good time had by all that who attended it. 
I wanted to congratulate um, our police department on the promotions of Captain Austin and is it Paul Berry? Is that the other one? Sergeant Austin, Sergeant Pulverini. Yes, ma'am. Sergeant Pulverini. Okay. Thank you. So congratulations to them. Um, I also look forward uh, to finding out more information for the Stallings. Um, and also my condolences to the Smith family. I actually went to school with his brother and uh, my sympathies to the whole family. Thank you. Are there any other counselor communications? All right, I have a couple of uh, comments that I'd like to make. First of all, uh, this is in regard to the Fair Rent Commission. Uh, as many of you know, the state of Connecticut has updated the laws for this particular topic, and uh, we have an ordinance that will need to be updated before July 1st of 2023, and uh, we will really have to reconstitute, get this Fair Rent Commission up and running again, uh, which has not met in recent years. And, and I know that there are several vacancies, so uh, this will be uh, brought, brought to order moving forward. Uh, next, um, sometime in the springtime, uh, community conversation on drug and o opioid use. I'd like to propose to my colleagues here at the dais that we think about another community conversation uh, in early spring uh, with, you know, our agencies, social services, youth services, and Field Together Coalition, the police, EMS, uh, our North Central Health District, to provide some updates and information to the community that will deal with from recreational marijuana coming online to the warnings about, you know, edibles and any, any data that, uh, you know, additional data that the uh, police department will have uh, in regard to saves and overdoses and, um, you know, make sure that people understand the risks as well as resources available. But I think uh, the springtime would be a good time for us to uh, discuss uh, that particular issue also. Um, it was brought to my attention. Um, this is from a letter that was received uh, that was given to me. Um, I know that he's in Councilor Santanello's district. Uh, Pat Crowley uh, was un unable to attend this meeting, and I'm going to submit this letter into um, the record. And very quickly, I'm just going to go through. This is in uh, addressing you tonight in support of the Enfield Grays Athletic Association, which is commonly known as the Grays Club. And we all know that it was destroyed by a devastating fire. They've been an active, positive youth sponsoring member in the community for close to 100 years. Since way before I was a child, they sponsored many youth sports teams and individuals in athletic competitions. First, I'd like to address you tonight as the former president and coach of the Ramblers and as a coach of Thompsonville Little League. On many occasions, the Grays Club sponsors teams and individuals that were in need of financial assistance and not doing so without any recognition or acknowledgement. During my tenure as president of the Ramblers, the Grays Club sponsored a scholarship anywhere from 15 to 25 individuals for the yearly fees and fundraising requirements, individuals who couldn't afford or necessary support to do so. Uh, this club has been a positive influence for this organization and part of the community. As a former player, coach, and board member of the Little League, the Grays Club sponsored um, many of these uh, involvements. Specific time that he was talking about, John Borowski showed up with a, a brand new grill and they had an emergency meeting. Everybody vo voted in favor of a new grill and taking care of us immediately. And it was all for the kids. Um, so just trying to summarize a, a little bit here, um, that he's encouraging uh, state, the town, and private individuals to help continue the legacy of this club and help facilitate the rebuilding, the restructuring, or possible relocation of this organization. Uh, the Grays Club have been a great stewards, and I can honestly state, uh, you know, or he would just want to say thank you for your consideration. Thanks for reading this, uh, Pat, Pat Crowley, and that's uh, 32 Alden Avenue. 
I do want to mention that the Grays Athletic Club will be a guest here on February 6th. And yes, uh, you know, we do need the community support to help uh, with them uh, with this you know, horrific uh, fire that they had. And uh, so as a community, we need to help support this group. So I just wanted to mention that they will be coming in front of us on February 6th. I know that we've had a few conversations with them and uh, helping them with raising funds and doing the proper paperwork uh, with the state of Connecticut for any sort of uh, help along with our, our town. Um, and the last thing uh, that I just want to mention, uh, mo moving forward here, um, we have a couple of meetings that are coming up and the diversity committee is going to be kicking off. Uh, we're looking at Monday, January 30th. I believe all the members have been sworn in now. So that meeting will, will be coming up. And I know that we've been working on a draft and, uh, you know, more to come with that. And, but we will be in contact in regard to that. Um, so thank you for that. I will pass this along to you, uh, Sheila, afterwards. So thanks for that. All right, next, um, long-awaited town manager report. Thanks. On some of the goals of what we've been working on. So I wanted to just spend a little bit talking about the economic development function because it really drives a lot of the policies, the work of the people in this building, and the work of the commissions, whether it be land use boards, um, regulatory officials, people who are really ambassadors on boards, and frankly, anybody that comes in contact. So we put together a little bit of a presentation about really kind of where we've been spending the bulk of our time. Obviously, the projects that are coming up, um, a lot of this is based on partnerships. And I'm going to start with the most recent success that we've had with the last referendum. The public safety complex is coming to fruition. We are hoping that this item lands on Friday's bond commission agenda. And as you know, we are hoping to get the $12.8 million from the state to augment this. With that bond authorization, if it does come at this meeting, we will then hopefully look to solicit a building committee and begin the process of what needs to be done with that project. Uh, we also have, uh, thanks through the budget process as well as the infusion of some ARPA funds, we've been able to fast forward a lot of projects. Uh, the one that I chose to highlight today is the Enfield High School tennis courts track and turf replacement, and I'm highlighting it for a couple of reasons. This actually was a partnership project where both the Board of Ed and the town put money together in order to advance and accelerate the replacement of all of this down at the high school so it could be done in an expedient fashion from all of our different reserve funds. So I think it's a, a true classic case of partnership and how you see pieces of the town government working together to benefit the citizens. So as you can see, we have our total numbers and then there was funding from both sides for a total investment over the last seven months of almost $3 million down at the high school in order to facilitate those fields that are so heavily used. Uh, the American Rescue Plan obviously gave a lot of flexibility and was allowed through the budget process to fund various things. A few that I highlighted so that the public can see where some of these um, categories are going are the police cruisers that you put in to bring us back up to almost where we should be with the vehicle replacement schedule. Um, the Enfield schools through various projects received another bulk of it through the facilities. And we've also earmarked $3 million of the total of almost 13 to go into the sewer systems, the infrastructure, and the improvement of our pump stations, which is a critical public service. And in addition to that, we used a portion of almost $2.4 million in the budget process to fast track the purchase of equipment that had been languishing as well in terms of replacement plans. 
So the, the purpose really of this money was to help government get over the COVID pandemic impact. Um, while we're still seeing and suffering from some of the supply chain issues, this infusion has really helped us get over the hump in terms of the provision of services, equipment, and everything else that is needed. And obviously with Thompsonville, there's a lot happening. So keeping with the theme of really kind of connecting the dots, I wanted to showcase where some of those dollars are coming from and where they're going to be going. Um, obviously this bridge has been the focus uh, in, in the media recently as it's starting to get underway and then we'll pick up again in the spring. This is another partnership project where we are getting uh, federal aid, it's an 80%, 20% split between the federal government and us for this bridge, which had uh, a very low ranking. Um, it also is a critical component, component for future infrastructure for our transit-oriented district when you think about the train station coming on one side, the connectivity to uh, Thompsonville Village, but also this bridge is the dividing point between South River and North River. And as many of you know, there is um, something that's been circulating for a couple of years about doing a project on South River Street that we're, you know, as the town still waiting to get information on. There's been an informal administrative re review team meeting with uh, town staff a while ago, but nothing has percolated since. But on the other side, on North River Street, there is that large area of undeveloped property consisting of the Levitz property and the Eversource property. And we have been doing some real significant work with, with those partners to see if we can spur on some development. Uh, Eversource recently demolished one of their dilapidated buildings there. We are encouraging them to continue to invest in that area. The casket building area has just been cleaned up. The berm is now constructed, and this area is ripe for reinvestment. So all we can say right now is stay tuned for some exciting things that could be happening on North River Street in conjunction with the train platform. Um, again, I love this visual of the impact residential development. This showcases what would be the first phase facing freshwater pond. It's 55 units of work, workforce housing. They're proposing a $28 million investment right here um, in Thompsonville. And we contributed as a partner by doing the remediation and the demolition piece for both of those buildings there. There is also discussion about a second phase, which would be facing Pleasant Street, which would be another infusion of investment from Impact Residential as well. That is still being worked on, and we will hopefully be hearing more about that in the very near future. Higgins Park, another Thompsonville asset, uh, is going to see 820,000 of investment with the band shell that is on order finally and will, should be here in April or May. We have fitness stations going in around the walking path. We have expanded parking planned to connect this parking lot with where the express is. And we also threw in here the bike path, bike path expansion, which is coming up through the bridge on Franklin, down Route 5, and into Thompsonville as well to promote that connectability that everybody's been asking for, as well as it's an increase in pedestrian and bike safety. So that money is designated through Higgins Park as well. Uh, another interesting project is a very um, contaminated property on Prospect Street, which is next to Kelly Fredette. Uh, Nelson Tereso from the Economic Development Office has been working for a long time with them because they had interest in expansion there. He was able to obtain a $550,000 environmental grant that is in the process of being cleaned up right now. So if you go by there, you will see the activity. Nelson estimated today that the project is about 75% complete. At that point, when the remediation is done and signed off on, the town of Enfield will sell that parcel to Kelly Fredette to facilitate their expansion, which is going to be a huge asset for that part of town and a great reuse of that property. The train platform is going to be the jewel piece in Thompsonville, which will be uh, a great asset for the town. The total investment there from federal and state government is over $31 million and counting. So that's something that's going to tie together all of this as well. And, and really for this project is what flows from that is our presence now in Thompsonville from a code and blight enforcement standpoint as well, because we want to get the rest of the area ready for when all of this starts to happen, because we do believe that Thompsonville is going to see a renaissance as a very desirable place to live. 
The Connecticut River is there because I kind of uh, spotlighted some of the things that might be coming to North River Street, but I also wanted to highlight Ronnie Salas's two properties on North Main Street and Main Street, which are in the process of being renovated as well. Uh, the Main Street one is next to the Gray's Club, and we are working with the Gray's Club because that is one of the last historic buildings that we have. We had the State Historic Preservation Officer up here last week. She also looked at the Salas Building, and there are some tax incentive programs that I think are going to be available to them. And then the facade has already been done on the uh, Main Street Building where Community Health Services is, and that has come out really well. And there are a couple new tenants that are already moving in there. So um, that plus the old Thompsonville Fire Department on the other corner that is hopefully being renovated by Pat Tolerita is going to be a nice uh, piece right for that intersection. In terms of the future investments and where we're spending some time, obviously the mass mutual proposal for the sports complex is one that is a huge driver for North Enfield in terms of visitor traffic, tourism, reuse of a defunct park, and something that would be very beneficial for us in terms of what this complex currently does for the grand list and what we hope it could do. The proposed investment is being estimated at anywhere from 50 to 90 million. And as you all know very well, because you saw the presentation, we're in the due diligence stage for this and we'll be going to the Planning and Zoning Commission on Thursday night for the Section 8-24. There's already been a pre-administrative review team meeting that happened last week where there was great feedback given by our regulatory officials in order to really kind of ease the way for anything that could possibly be an obstacle that could be discussed in ahead of time so that we know what they possibly are. So more on that, stay tuned. The mall is one of those projects where you know, it's privately held, but we have tried to build a relationship with them, but we have also maintained a very firm stance on property maintenance and what we expect from them to be in the middle of town. And I believe that they are now realizing, especially with the $100,000 lien that got placed on them for, for this project last summer, that we are serious about that. Uh, they have cooperated with us on the traffic study, and they are generally responsive when we call them about certain things. But in general, this building is definitely at, at the end of its useful life in terms of how it's currently situated and a reuse or a redevelopment of this entire parcel, meaning the one that have, they have not already sold off uh, fronting Elm Street is definitely a priority for 2023 to continue to work with them or hopefully new owners. Uh, this project is currently in front of TIFF. This is where the um, barns and the farm was at the top of, is that Palumba? Yeah, Palumba and um, Route 220. So this is the Elm Street project that Frank Triano is bringing forward that is being considered for a TIF investment. And we are hoping to see that move along in the next six months as well. And then this is an interesting project because this popped back on the radar. As many of you may recall last summer, we had an interest in this and it fell through because the buyer um, was not the first in line. And we found out that it had been sold while we were in the process of helping them apply for a grant. Well, that sale fell through and the people that we were working with last summer are now interested again in having a conversation with the, with the owners of the former Porter and Chester. So this is a critical property um, in that section of town that we do not like to see in this kind of condition. It's a, a problem for a quality of life standpoint for that neighborhood. And uh, as you can see, not all economic development is centered downtown or on commercial areas. This is uh, definitely a priority as well. And I believe that we're having a meeting on Thursday morning to see what we can do in order to move this along. The small business growth here in Enfield has been really steady over the course of the last year, which is the time period that I can speak to. And in the folders that you received at your dais for the extra materials for tonight, you will see the log that we keep in the town manager's office anytime we touch a small business. So on that list, there's, I think, about 68 visits and or meetings and or interactions that we've had to give you an idea of some of the other work that we do in terms of facilitating that. Um, I would also like to say that there seems to be a significant investment growth within minority owned businesses. And in seeing that, we have also set up a different set of resources to be made available to them through the state and other state resource agencies that they might not be available of. So the Economic and Community Development Office is now acting as a portal in order to connect people 
with other opportunities as well. We're also positioning ourselves not just from a small business standpoint, but from the provision of municipal services and some of these larger projects to get as much grant money as possible. And you've heard me talk about this at other meetings, but the Community Investment Fund grant, which we reapplied for, the Community Challenges grants, um, the infrastructure money that's coming through with former Mayor Mark Boughton, all of this is ripe for reinvestment in communities just like Enfield. And we are going to make sure that we're in a good position in order to get Enfield fair share. Um, several people went into helping make this presentation and now I'm going to ask John Wilcox who gets his own slide to come up. Um, <laughs> some of you had asked to kind of get a little bit of a preview of next year's budget by looking at where we stand right now after the first six months of the fiscal year. So he's going to tag along to this report and that was circulated to you in your packets on Friday. If you have any questions, he's here to answer them, but also um, I'll cede the floor to him so he can give you any pearls of wisdom concerning our budget, where we are right now and where we're going. So thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, just in, in general on this, um, there's, there's two components that we, we try to analyze where we stand um, in relation to uh, um, the, the budget versus last year and, and past years. In, in accounting, um, things generally are pretty consistent from year to year. Um, you know, if, if not, there's an explanation for it. Um, so, for example, um, we started fiscal year 22 with um, like 95 police officers and we added to the budget, so that would obviously be an increase. There, but there's an explanation for it. Um, you know, so we've been dealing with, um, with many different um, um, capital projects, uh, major capital projects, the uh, sewer facility, the high school, the JFK, uh, roads. Um, so those are an explanation for, for increases in the bonding that we um, would have in, from year to year. So when I ana analyze them, I try to look at the actually the, the percentage of budget that's expended um, from year to year, because that usually should be fairly consistent unless there's an outside explanation. Um, basically, I'm looking at it. There were not uh, significant changes, um, I, as I summarized in the um, in the memo attached to it. Um, you know, our tax collections are are down a little bit, um, you know, 0.47% uh, from, a, you know, percentage of budget collected this year versus percentage of budget collected last year. I don't believe that's a significant number yet. I obviously, we keep monitoring it um, to, to see where that goes. And if there is, we'd have to uh, um, take steps to, uh, to, to uh, deal with it as best we can. Um, Whereas the, the other um, things that you'll see in here are, you'll notice that the actual percentage of expenditures as it relates, relates to budget have, have increased. And the, the biggest the explanation from that um, is the fact that we budget for, um, we don't budget estimated increases in salaries when we have union contracts that are either pending or they're set to expire in the fall at the end of the current fiscal year. Um, so this summer we had three, um, three contracts that were expiring at, at the end of June of 2022. And we had the, uh, the largest union and that expired in June of 2021. So those budgets remain flat, um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Mainly, you don't want to show increases one year, decreases the next year in the salaries because we provide salary information for each uh, position in the budget book. Um, so if you hold your budget flat and then the budget is settled, which we had uh, I think four budgets settled this year, you see an increase in pay, but you, the budget was held flat. 
in the individual divisions. I account for, I take it, I make estimates for what those increases will be and they are in a separate, they're down here in this largely detailed one down here in the bottom in the non-departmental expenditures. That's where I put the estimates for what the union contracts will will be. And that's, um, that's the main explanation for most of those increased in, in uh, um, percentage of budget spent in all the individual divisions. And um, if you have any specific questions, I'm uh, more than willing to answer whatever, you, whatever I can. Councilor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Mr. Wilcox. I found this to be a really helpful chart, especially with the percentages. Uh, a couple questions about some of those line items. Um, so for the celebrations, uh, section it looks like you know that's at 100 percent i was curious what all goes into that um, i know there's a lot of town celebrations and some of them are hosted by the town some of them are through partnerships with uh, non-town entities yeah the, the largest one is the uh fourth of july celebration um there's i think i can't I, off the top of my head i can't think of the, the specifics on i can get them for you um, the reason in that one, um, I believe there was a, a lower number last year because I, I don't believe we even had the, the, the FY22 number would have happened in July of 2021 for the 4th of July celebration, which we didn't have due to uh, COVID. So that number is significantly lower last year than this year. And then uh, the other one I was, I was kind of focusing on was the, the debt service. So it's at about 70%. I'm just curious, your thoughts. I, I think about debt, serv debt service a lot. I was curious, you know, your thoughts and feelings on that. Um, how do you feel in regard to our debt service in town? You know, do we need to think more about it, allocating more money for it, or is it in a, a pretty healthy place? Um, I have done uh, several schedules on the, on the projected debt service. Um, and I've discussed it with our bond um, um, consultants, our finance consultants for bonding and stuff. They, their main concern would be uh, if we got to a period where we had debt service of $16 million in any fiscal year, we would end up being downgraded as far as uh, uh, Moody's or Standard & Poor's. Um, Right now, I've projected out, like I said, for about the next 30 or 40 years, um, eh, probably not 40, but I've projected each of the related bond issues out into probably 2020, 2050, and we do not hit that. We are a little closer maybe than I would like, and but I'm a, I'm, I'm, it's my job to panic on that stuff. But we're, we're actually around 13 million, uh, a little more than 13 million, I think, in, in like the 2027, 2028 timeframe with the projects that we currently have. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Nick. Are there any other questions for Mr. Wilcox? John, thank, thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for this update. Very informative. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we just have one other quick piece of the town manager's report from the assistant town manager. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, just real quickly, I want to give you a little uh, briefing on our COVID cases. We've seen a little uptick in um, some employees, uh, EMS department in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we had six or seven employees get COVID full-time and part-time employees, but we're managing through that. Um, a few in DPW, a few in library, a sprinkling in other departments. Um, and we're anticipating it's because of the holidays recently, people were gathering. Uh, fortunately, we're seeing a downtick according to the data in RSV, which is a respiratory virus and the flu. So that's positive, but um, we're not um, asking employees to uh, mandate masks or anything. Everyone's just covering themselves accordingly, washing, sanitizing, and, and we will weather through this like we have been. That's all I got. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, great. All right, uh, there's no unfinished business. Uh, moving onward to uh, item 12, 12A, consent agenda. There is one item on the consent agenda. Um, 
And that item is a request of transfer of funds for the Enfield Cultural Arts Commission in the amount of 8732 uh, Is there a motion to approve? Motion. Uh, Councilor Mangini and a second by Deputy Mayor Sakala. Um, all in favor by show of hands. Um, opposed? Abstentions? Okay, uh, six, in, six in favor, five opposed. Item B, Town Council um, appointments. Uh, there are none. Item C, moving on. Okay, referral from the Public Safety Committee to the Town Attorney, attorney for the removal of the aggressive dogs <laughs> ordinance and re relocation of animal waste language uh, to another ordinance. Before I read the resolution to this item, um, I want to note that if it's approved, uh, this will require a public hearing. I just want to make that uh, public to everybody. And uh, combining with the, our efforts to change the massage therapy ordinance and a couple of others that are being uh, considered by the subcommittee so that we can publish once and have one public hearing with these several items uh, just to, uh, to make it a little more fluid so we don't have eight public hearings uh, at eight different times. We're going to try to have them all, all in once. Uh, once again, uh, be it resolved that the town council authorizes applicable town staff to commence with the necessary steps for the repeal of the town code sections 10-51 through 10-56 inclusive. Uh, Councilor Mangini second. and a second by Deputy Mayor Sakala. Um, discussion, uh, Councilor Ludwig. Are we going to get like an explanation on what this is? Because the way I read this, this wasn't the intent, in my opinion, of what we were asking at the time. I, I appreciate whoever gave me the state, the state uh, law, but that was the issue at the time. Is that they, the residents were being told that we were following the state law? And that's why they couldn't take the dog. And then we were looking at our own ordinance that it made it had more teeth. If I read this, it looks like we're actually getting rid of our ordinance to follow state law, unless I'm misunderstanding, and, I, and you certainly can correct me. But that was the issue with the residents at the time, is that we were, they were being told that we were following state law and nothing was being done. So we are changing it in order to use the state law, but we are retaining one small piece of this ordinance. So we're not getting rid of chapter 10 in its entirety. I will defer to attorney Serrato or possibly the chief if they'd like to talk about the mechanics of it, but we are trying to clean it up and use what is out there in terms of um, the state law. But the state law we were told didn't apply to the original issue of why we referred it to the public safety committee. I can't speak no. to that. I just know that when we do look at issues like this, we look at what the state law says and what our ordinances say, right. and the state law is the one that we're going to use. Can, uh, can someone give us an explanation? What's yeah, the well, difference? Um, yeah. um, yep. Uh, they, Councilor uh, Despard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes. Yeah, so we this did come through, um, and what we found out was our uh, ordinance is just it's uh, not in line with state statute. Therefore, it's not legal. So what our animal control officers were already following as our is state law. So having this, uh, our ordinance is just, it's extra and it's, uh, it, again, it's not being used. So that was the recommendation that was sent over uh, to our town attorney's office. They uh, looked into it, came back to us with this recommendation. Um, it's just, you know, basically it's just, it's cleaning things up. To the issue that the residents uh, had, my understanding is, and I think there's a pretty good um, uh, record of this, what was happening was things weren't being reported in such a way where it met the threshold of the state statute. So uh, for whatever reason, residents uh, uh, weren't reporting. Uh, so they, they might have been they might have been reporting to us, but they weren't reporting in uh, to the animal control officers, whatever it may be. It just didn't meet the threshold for uh, that dog to be seized or removed. 
I appreciate. I, I still have the floor, so I appreciate that. But again, I, I have to disagree because we were told they, and I actually spoke with the animal control officer that there were a number of complaints. I'm reading the law right here, and it's pretty clear that you know I don't know if we were following the state law. Uh, so I'm reading it. It's in front of me, and it's based on what I was told and what I and I know there was complaints issued. So I don't know what it does us to follow state law that I guess that we're not following. I, so I, I just um, I know you have the floor, but just um, you know I did look into it at, uh, f uh, with the town manager and the chief, and I think that that was the um, the conclusion was that they hadn't quite hit that threshold yet, and I'm not sure if if, if I'm misreading that or not. No, are you speaking? So I know I, I apologize. I know, and I'm, I, I, we can get a public report of how many times the officers were called to go out there, which was numerous times. Is this the Columbia? Yes, this was numerous times. Not once, not twice. Probably ten to fifteen. So how's that not me? I'm reading. The, I appreciate you giving me the state law. And it looks like we weren't following state law. Now we're getting rid of an ordinance. Maybe it's messy, whatever. But the point at the time of the reference to the public safety was, hey, look, maybe we have more teeth in our ordinance that we can build up that, again, when state law doesn't apply, well, we have our own re remedy. And here we're just getting rid of it and following state law that in this situation was told, again, didn't rectify the situation on numerous complaints. And again, I'm, I'm an animal lover. I don't see any animal taken away. But when it's clearly attacked people, and again, I have to admit, the way this is being handled is a little bit weird for me. Sorry for lack of a better word. Well, I can't speak directly to the Columbia Road without my notes, but I do know that in that case, there was a lot of people calling the police. But there were not a lot of people making the final reports in terms of my hand was bitten, my child's arm was bitten. We didn't have that. So the threshold that Councillor Despard is referencing is what never was reached. So, the, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but the Columbia Drive situation has I resolved yeah, I itself. Understand. Yeah, yeah, no, but that, yeah. unfortunately, uh, yeah, yeah, I hear you. No. So I would have to go back and recreate that, but I do believe that the steps that we're taking at this point make sense for what we need to do for future enforcement. I, I, so if we're going to follow state law, then when we, I'm, I'm requesting when our officer goes out there, then they quote the law that we're following because they were told we we're following state law and that's why we couldn't do anything. That was, again, I, I'm paraphrasing. I'm sure there's truth. Maybe there's truth elsewhere, but that I was told by numerous people and most of those people were carrying mace when I saw them. So this wasn't a one-time thing. So again, if we're going to follow state law, then let's make sure that we follow state law then if we're not going to have an ordinance. That's just it. So I appreciate your explanation. I'm not giving you a hard time. Thank you. All right. Well, th well thank, thank you for that. Once again, uh, the, the subcommittee's recommendation um, is to repeal sections 10-51 through 10-56. Um, ready, ready to vote on this. Sheila, roll call. Councilor Mangini? Four. Councilor Nelson? Four. Councilor Pisner? Four. Councilor Santanella? Four. Councilor Ungeyer? Four. De uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala? Four. Mayor Crisati? Four. Councilor Despard? Four. Councilor Finger? Four. Councilor Hopkins? Four. Councilor Ludwig? Against. It's 10 in favor, one against. Item D, discuss the resolution. The resolution waiving the bid requirements for the purchase of two motorcycles for the police department. The resolution waiving the bid requirements for the purchase of two motorcycles for the police department. Whereas the Enfield Police Department is purchasing two motorcycles and whereas the Enfield Police Department will need a qualified vendor that is located close to Enfield and has the ability to provide repairs and maintenance in a timely manner. And whereas Max BMW motorcycles have been identified as the only organization in the region that sells, services, and maintains these motorcycles. Now, therefore, it be resolved that in accordance with Chapter 5, Section 8, Paragraph D of the Enfield Town Charter, the Enfield Town Council does hereby determine that it is against the best interest of the town to require competitive bidding for the purchase of these motorcycles, date January 11, 2023, <laughs> submitted by Chief Alaric J. Fox and Field Police Department. So moved. Councilor Mangini. Second. And seconded by Deputy Mayor Sakala. Um, 
Councillor Pisner. Okay, so. I'm, uh, if uh, excuse me, just oh, for sorry. one second. Chief, would you like to come up? Oh, okay. Yep. Thank you, Murray. Yep, no worries. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. What is, shall I? A brief yes, summary? Yes, your brief summary. What is before you, you ultimately is nothing other than the bid waiver. However, anticipating there may be questions as to the underlying issue, I do come before you with appropriate data and information uh, that may help explain to you how we got here. Thank you. Councillor Pisner. Okay, so we're doing a bid waiver, which I'm familiar with, but usually it gives us an amount. It doesn't say here what the motorcycles are going to cost and what effect it has on the budget that you, you have. So that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what I'm questioning. Um, so I'll do the second part first as it's the easier one. No impact on the budget being purchased out of our federal asset forfeiture funds. And as to the first part, I apologize, perhaps I'm mistaken. When I've done a bid waiver before, I've just done the bid waiver for the bid waiver. I haven't reached the the dollar amount on the issue. It's simply been a bid waiver request. If that's an error on my part, I apologize. I did not think it uh, typically included that. Okay. Councilor Finger. Hi, Chief. Thank you very well, much sir. for coming back up again, yes, sir. sir. Thank you. You bet. So um, I, I, I researched motorcycles and this, uh, this is Max BMW, depending on, you know, it, it's basically a touring bike. And it's basically around twenty-five thousand dollars, depending on what you get for bells and whistles and lights and everything else that gets put onto it. Um, so, like when you buy a brand new motorcycle, um, you, you have the opportunity of getting, let's we'll say, a five-year package of maintenance. All right, which means that they do all the oil changes and it goes wrong with the bike. It's no cost to you because you've already done the maintenance agreement. Is that something that's going to be part of the purchase? Of these bikes, it is not. I have three. Uh, bid, I, I have three numbers, if you will, for BMWs, Harleys, and Hondas. Mm -hmm. And for purposes of apples to apples, oranges to oranges, there were no service packages added to any of them. I mean, I could add that in, and, and presumably it would raise them roughly equal amounts. But apples to apples, oranges to oranges, the prices are best with the BMW package. Okay, and knowing that we still have those other two Harleys sitting in the garage. When was the last time those the last time those bikes were used? Uh, they were used. They are used. They are uh, two thousand and sixes. Mm -hmm. They are seventeen years old. Mm -hmm. They are in uh, serviceable but uh, less than ideal condition. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, these two would supplement those two. Okay. I, have, I have four certified motorcycle operators. When we have parades, when we have the Fourth of July events, and the green closes down, the only way to the best way to provide traffic control services for parades and the only way to get to close down areas for the 4th of July, as an example, is on, some, on, on a two-wheeled vehicle. In the past, we have had to rely on out-of-town motorcycles when we have had our own 4th of July celebrations, and that is like a knife in the back to me. I have to ask South Windsor and Manchester motorcycle operators to, to assist uh, our town during that brief window. These BMWs uh, would supplement the two Harleys that I would seek to keep up and running as long as we can. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, the other thing I got is, um, oh, God, is to see, got them. Not going to trade them in. Obviously, there's no worth to the, to the, to the trade in, because I'm sure. And um, the last thing I, I know, like, basically not the last thing, but the one that really kind of concerns me is being a biker all my life. You know, um, I sold my bike, as you know, because I made it public. Yes, sir. I, I'm having a hard time looking at this, and 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 I'll, and I'll be honest with you, is that I think I'm going to abstain tonight because I'm a biker, which I want the guys to have the bikes. There's no doubt about it. I want them to have them, but I don't want to be the one to have the final decision to give them one in case something happens to them and they have to go. To, we have to go to their families. So to me, almost being crunched a few times, it's 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 in here. It's not up here. It's it's in here. So um, you know, I wish you the best of luck. If you get the votes, that's fantastic. If you don't, I'm sorry. But um, it, this is just to me. I think in, in today's days and age, it's just it's just too scary out to be out there on bikes, including being an officer. We're, our officers are being you know in enough danger as it is. They can't even do a chase anymore without anything, without something happening. So. Um, 
Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate, I appreciate your concern for their well-being. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nelson. Uh, thank you, Chief. What is the price difference between the BMWs and the Harley Davidsons? The BMWs are twenty thousand one forty-five. The Harleys are twenty-three seven ninety-five. The Hondas are twenty-five one thirty-one. The price difference between the BMW and the Harleys, multiplied by two, is seventy-three hundred. And if I might continue on briefly, mm -hmm. the BMWs get better fuel mileage. The BMWs can go off-road, which is not something that I'm encouraging, mm -hmm. but the Harleys cannot. And when we take complaints about dirt bikes or AT, when you take complaints about dirt bikes and ATVs, this is at least an option for us to talk about, subject to my ability to pursue them, which brings <laughs> us to the state law. Um, the uh, BMWs are lighter, and the BMWs, I'm told, do not physically run as hot, uh, physically like you know sitting on them in the middle of the summer. Lastly, to keep it apples to apples, oranges to oranges, and this is on the economic side, the BMWs come with the light package included. The Harleys do not. So the BMWs would only need an install on an Enfield radio. The Harleys would need the radio and the full lighting package. That additional cost is 10179 The 10179 plus the 7300 is a savings of 17479 Okay, well, you were prepared for that question. <laughs> I'm kind of speechless, but uh, I know um, I was part of the original uh, discussions bringing the motorcycles to Enfield, and we had a very long discussion about the different motorcycles. And yes, there were cheaper options out there, but Harley Davidson came out on top throughout performance um, throughout the country with other departments. And I'm just looking at the history of these motorcycles. They're 16 years old. Um, I'm sure they don't have mega miles on them because it's not like we take them out of town and stuff. But all in all, they've been a good motorcycle considering what they go through in training, getting dropped and stuff like that. So um, I, I'm all about American made and I think they've uh, made a name for themselves. But with the light package and everything else, it's kind of hard to stick with them. So I'm going to have to agree with you on this one. Thank you very much for the explanation. Thank you, sir. We'll go right down. Are you okay, Councillor Santanella? Uh, hi, Chief. Thanks. So, yes, sir. because you're using federal uh, funds for this, does it? matter if you get the Harley or the BMW? Like, is it covered? Is it a covered cost or are the funds available to you limited? And I guess the, my the, question is, is there a scenario where this could impact the budget? Or no, does, sir. does the program just say you can purchase two motorcycles, they can be $30,000, you'll be reimbursed 60, so you have the option and there's no impact to our budget. I appreciate the question. There is no impact to your budget. There will be no, there could be no. I have a dollar amount that ebbs and tides based on the federal asset forfeiture money that's in there. I use that for wholly legitimate department expenses that are not funded by the town. I have the money in that account to pay for these. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Councillor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, just very briefly, um, I think bid waiver uh, discussions are really good. I appreciate everybody th everybody's thoughts on this. For me, it's just the threshold of have you justified that. And I thank you for taking the time and coming out here and doing yes, this. Sir. I think it makes sense to waive the bid waiver uh, in bid requirement in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have one final uh, comment, yes, here, sir. Chief, before we move onward. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I greatly appreciate that. A um, couple of things now. Uh, these motorcycles, um, you know, so part of this bid waiver that you have here. Um, motorcycles uh, on a state contract, I see it in the highlighted, are more expensive than what we're seeking here. Yes, sir. And... So when I see about, you know, the bid waiver, you have a local shop that would have easy access in the event that something did go wrong with the bike or whatever, you know, easy maintenance, you know, they, that they will take care of, uh, of, of us as compared to going downstate and getting another, 
you know, motorcycle or a couple of purchase motorcycles through a state contract. So I am all in favor of this bid requirement. Definitely makes sense uh, to that. And one other thing I just want to mention in regards to uh, like the the training of um, with, with the with the motorcycles. Do you train your uh, for sp uh, doing spills? Um, you know, are these bikes used for that or is the older ones? So I appreciate the question. Yeah. The, uh, the the urban legend in the law enforcement world, uh, and perhaps it's not an urban legend, is the two schools that you go to that aren't gimmies are the, the Crest SWAT Team Training School and the Motorcycle Training School, where the failure rates run in a neighborhood of about 50%. There's no, there's no joking and there's no horsing around. We do not uh, and would not be dumping these motorcycles and training. We send our officers typically to the Hartford Police Department where they do their training. They do ride our motorcycles there. They're not going to damage, uh, they're certainly not gonna damage the BMWs. And right. uh, the Harleys have been dropped in training, um, but that, uh, that would be the split I would make with these two. They do, um, I'm not a motorcycle rider. I, I respect folks that ride even at a recreational level. What the folks in these classes are trained to do is beyond uh, amazing um, and uh, they will they will not be dumping the BMWs thank you thank you <laughs> Councilor Ledwick so what will they be dumping then if they are if they need to dump a because they have to dump to get right to get certified correct so I, I let's be clear here I mean you're making a statement that we're not going to dump the BMWs. What are we going to dump the Harleys or a training right. motorcycle if one is made available by the Hartford Police Department I, you know, I'm fundamentally against this. I don't think we need motorcycles. I, I'm not against motorcycles. Rider, they can do what they want, but I don't see as a department we need them. I'll be voting no, but appreciate you being there. Okay. Just one more question. Thank you. I thought you were done, Councillor Nelson. I, I but I, I will allow you. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, Councillor Nelson. Just, Chief, what is the balance left in your asset forfeiture fund? It's about, it was about $100,000. So after this purchase, we will be in the neighborhood of uh, 60. I did, uh, I did submit a report on that in response to the last inquiry um, through the town manager that can be made available right. to you. So. This is what I was discussing last meeting about the seizure, the drugs and the money that they get to keep half the money. So the drug dealers just bought us two new motorcycles. Good job, Chief. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you for the update. Yes, sir. But uh, thank you. Sheila, roll call, please. <clears throat> Councilor Mangini? Four. Councilor Nelson? Four. Councilor Pisner? Four. Councilor Santanella? Four. Councilor Ungayer? Four. Deputy Mayor Sakala? Four. Mayor Crisati? Four. Councilor Despard? Four. Councilor Finger? Abstain. Councilor Hopkins? Four. And Councilor Ludwig? Against. That's nine in favor, one against, and one abstention. Item E, discussion resolution request for transfer of funds to outfit new police hires. Uh, once again, uh, we've hired many officers of late. I think I have uh, a cot in your office, Chief, and uh, you know, <laughs> and and and, uh, and I love going to all of the uh, events. Uh, uh, and I know it costs a lot uh, for your new hires going to the academy and everything. So I'll let you speak to that. But the resolution be it resolved that in accordance with Chapter Six, Section Eight F of the Town Charter, the following transfer hereby made from the police salaries part time of eighty nine thousand five hundred ninety six dollars to the police professional development uniforms and health uh, professional development forty thousand nine hundred dollars uniforms thirty eight thousand seven hundred dollars health services. $9,996, date prepared January 18th, 2023, prepared by Captain Jeffrey J. Golden. So moved. Councilor Mangini. Second. And is second by Councilor Nelson. Uh, any discussion on this, uh, Councilor Mangini? <clears throat> Thank you. Chief, the question I have is, is a very basic question. It's probably part of the uniform and it is not stated here, but are you including bulletproof vests for our officers? Yes, ma'am. That is a that is an initial issue, and that has replaced it for five years. Okay. 
and they're current and up to date, so Absolutely. our officers are fully protected. Absolutely. And then the second part of my question are the, the canines. I know at one point in time there was a person in Enfield who's no longer with us, and she would donate money um, for the purposes of the dogs having bulletproofs. Do we still um, outfit our dogs? We do. Uh, the, the use of the bulletproof vest on the dog is a very case-by-case -case situation. The okay. dog's strength comes from its speed and its agility, and when the vest is on it, it loses those dynamics. Okay. So in a given situation, if we knew the canine was going to be exposed or likely exposed to gunfire, that would be a trade that would be made, certainly not on a on a day-to-day -day basis, as we would expect an officer to wear their vests. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Councilor Ludwig. Hi, Chief. Can you give a little more detail on the, the part-time salaries? What exactly is the 90 grand coming from? Yes. So we fund uh, out of our part-time salary account two community service aides, and we fund the uh, uh, crossing guards. The crossing guards uh, are using the amount that we would have expected them to use. The community service aides I'm underutilizing, so I have money to the good in that account. One community service aide left, and it took a while to get that replacement in, so there was a gap in that area. And the other community service aide, I'm proud to tell you, Captain Matt Bilgen from the Auxiliary Corps, uh, comes to work and typically, he comes to work wearing his auxiliary uniform and figuratively his auxiliary hat. And because he comes in in that capacity, he does not bill the town for what otherwise would have been worked hours. Thank you. Yes, sir. Councillor Hopkins. Thank you. And so this is exclusively from the, from that pool of money. Yes, sir. Uh, this is in 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 PD budget one one resource to another resource where I'm where I'm running lean and where I believe we have the money available. Thank you, and I and appreciate your good stewardship of that money. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Okay. Thank thank you, Chief. Greatly appreciate you, your expertise. Uh, Sheila, roll call. Councillor Mangini. Four. Councillor Nelson? Four. Councillor Pisner? Four. Councillor Santanella? Four. Councillor Ungeyer? Four. Deputy Mayor Sakala? Four. Mayor Crisotti? Four. Councillor Despard? Four. Councillor Finger? Four. Councillor Hopkins? Four. Councillor Ludwig? Four. Eleven in favor and none against. Thank you. Thank you. Good okay. Mm. Item F, discussion resolution, the recommendation from Public Works Subcommittee to implement transitioning the Enfield Housing Authority from tipper barrel pickup to dumpsters from the Enfield Housing Authority. Uh, for item F, the recommendation is to table this item. Motion to table. Uh, a motion by uh, Councilor Man uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala and seconded by Councilor Mangini. We will move to item G. Discussion. To table it. Yeah, he can table it. He can take a motion to table it, but we just need the vote. Okay. Sheila, roll call. It can be a, a show by, of hands. Show by hands. Okay. Yes. Uh, unanimous 11 0. Okay. All right, item G. <clears throat> Discussion resolution, the receipt of the draft plan of conservation and development to begin the 60 day, 65 day renewal period and to take necessary action. Uh, once again, this uh, agenda item has been a long time coming. All of the members, uh, we've received copies or a digital copy uh, for the proposed plan. Tonight, we're going to uh, have a motion for pu public hearing, so uh, which we will have. And it be the resolution will be, be it resolved that the Enfield Town Council does hereby receive the draft plan of the conservation and development from the Planning and Zoning Commission and we'll schedule a public hearing to receive comments from the public for Monday, February 13th, 2023 at 6 p.m. at JFK Middle School, 
55 Raffia Road, Nenfield, date prepared January 23rd, 2023, prepared by Town Manager Ellen Zapu Sasu. So moved. Uh, Councillor Nelson and is seconded Second. by Deputy Mayor uh, Sakala. Uh, let's see. Okay. Councillor Pisner. Um, okay, so I was on the POCD as a resident, and then once I became an elected town council, I, I was on it as liaison. Um, and I'm happy that we're going to be doing a, a public hearing because I've been hearing a lot about this from residents. So just so I understand, the 65-day clock, is it already started. It's not going to start from the public hearing, correct? It Six, starts. It has started. It started on the 12th. Yes. Okay, I just want to make that clear because I've had some questions on that. Um, as far as the public hearing goes, I want to make sure that this is publicized enough so that, you know, on the website, on ETV, in the newspaper, we this whole P POCD, it was all Zoom meetings, which I can remember sitting in on the first one and there was like 45 people. And then we were like begging people to come to these meetings. Um, and then finally COVID broke um, and we were able to start meeting, but by then, you know, it was just crazy. So I do think it's so important for residents to come out to look at this. This is the document for the next 10 years on how our town is going to move forward. Um, and, and there's some stuff in here, I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't agree with. Um, and there's some stuff I know that's mandated by the state. And I know there's stuff that I do agree with. So I'm encouraging residents to get a copy, even if you call, get one at the town hall, get it off your computers. Um, I do think this is an important meeting for residents to come to, and this is your opportunity to speak. So um, thank you. I'm glad we're doing the public hearing. Great, thank you. Uh, Sheila, roll call. Oh, excuse me. Oh, excuse me. Just hold on. All right, Councilor Just Hopkins. very briefly, I also I would love uh, for this to be able to get out to the public in an easily accessible way. It's a big deal. You know, this is a litmus test against which all land use uh, board uh, requests are tested against <coughs> really everything in town. It's very important. We only update it once every 10 years. So um, I, I imagine there's a portal online. If not, if you're looking for it online, please reach out to one of us. We'd be happy to give it to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Ludwig. I, I, I don't have the resolution. I don't know if anyone else is just curious that you read. I don't have it. So I just want to make sure that when we set the, what, what date are we set, setting the public hearing for? It's February 13th, 2023 at 6 p.m. 6 p.m.? Because I don't have a copy. JFK of Middle School. All right. All right, can we get a copy of the resolution? If possible. I don't know. I mean, yeah. Sure. Yeah. We just confirmed JFK today, which is why the leadership got the motion. Okay, we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it to you, Mike. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Sheila, roll call. Councilor Mangini? Four. Councilor Nelson? Four. Councilor Pisner? Four. Councilor Santanella? Four. Councilor Ungeyer? Four. Deputy Mayor Sakala? Four. Mayor Crisati? Four. Councilor Despard? Four. Councilor Finger? <coughs> Four. Councilor Hopkins? Four. And Councilor Ludwig? Four. It's 11 in favor, none against. Okay, item H, discussion resolution referral per CGS section 8-24 to the Planning and Zoning Commission concerning the pot potential disposition and the rescue of Nathan Hale School, Five, five Taylor Road. Um, also, we'll know, uh, I think everybody in your, your packet you should have a, uh, a formal letter of intent from the court. I will read the uh, resolution now. Be it resolved that the Town Council and the Board of Ed pursue the waiver of funds remaining on the amortization repayment schedule in order to pursue a reuse of Nathan Hale School at 5 Taylor Road. Date prepared January 20th, 2023, prepared by Ellen Zapusasu, the town manager. So moved. Uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala and is second by Councillor Mangini. Uh, Councillor Ludwig. So I guess I'm gonna be in a minority in on this one too, but what are we actually referring? We don't have a plan in front of us. We don't have numbers on what any potential deals are. So what are we actually referring to the planning and zoning? 
Um, whether they are in favor of us leasing or selling Nathan Hill School. Uh, again, I think this is backwards. This should be done at the end when we have a deal in place and things are done. I'm voting no. Thank you, Councillor Pisner. Okay, so my question would be, um, if we are, if we're going to end up owing money on this, I mean, because it's there's a possibility that if it's not a school, the town could get stuck with owing money on this. Am I correct? If I'm reading, the, if if I understand this correct? Okay, so and we will be asking for a waiver. Okay. Um, but we're going to be able to have a chance to vote on this again after it goes to planning and zoning. If it, if it ends up that I don't want to take on a building that we're going to have to impact our budget with. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. If this ends up having an impact on our budget, I, 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 want it, I, I don't want it to come to us. I want it to stay as a school. So how, when do we determine that? Well, one thing that this is a referral 824 referral to planning and zoning. Okay. This eventually will come back to us. Okay, that's all I want to know. Thank you. Um, uh, excuse me. Hi, sorry. Yeah. We have, I think that there were a couple of different drafts of the resolution, and the one that I have is different than the one Attorney Serrato has. So, just for clarification, which one do you have, Sheila? I have. Would you like it? Okay. Oh, they're all the same. Waiver. Waiver. They're all waivers. Yeah. yeah. So we have one that the recommendation is that the town of Enfield Town Council authorize the town manager to pursue the waiver as denoted in the resolution. This doesn't go to the. So we're not ready for a section 8 24 yet. No, that is that is in the recommendation on that paper on the same so that is sorry I know I'm just speaking out it's not my turn but that is under recommendations on the page the page that he just read that yes. resolution from uh, under the recommendation it states that the town of Enfield town council authorized the town manager to pursue the waiver as denoted in the resolution below there is no impact to the town budget. The eventual sale or lease may result in taxable property being added to the grand list. Okay. So I don't know that this is a referral to plan and zoning. No, if that's not my, that mine doesn't say so that. That's I think, I'm okay, so now I see what happened. The agenda item for the referral is wrong. So this is the waiver. So if you'd like to table it so that we have clarification for the next meeting, that's fine too. We we right, are going talk. to pursue, the Board of Education has already started the pursuit of the process for this, so we're not going to lose any time. But I didn't catch the agenda item versus the actual resolution. Those are, they I, I will two make different a, things. May, we'll make a motion to table. So Second. moved. The item. Second. Uh, and that's uh, Councillor. Ungar and seconded by Councillor Nelson. Okay. Sheila, yes. I just did. We're, you want to do a hand count? Well, we're going to do a hand okay. count. All in favor? <coughs> okay, eleven in favor. I'm, I'm against. Oh, and one against. No, I am against. I want to vote tonight. But, but the public sees is important. So that's fine. But the public. What is attached to our packet, which is on the public website, is exactly what we have, she has. It's just different. The caption is different than the paper. That's it says it. it right on the agenda. Point of order. It says right on the agenda, item H. That's what the public sees. Yes, but they see the paper attached to it, Mike. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. If it says something 824 and it doesn't say in a resolution. Okay, right, I thought okay. I had the floor, Mike. <clears throat> We, we will we will done. move forward to item I. I didn't know you get to decide what my vote is, Mike. My bad. Okay. Item I. Discussion resolution, the proposed ordinance establishing a number of justices of the peace at 75. Uh, be it resolved, the number of justices of the peace for the town is hereby fixed at 75 to be chosen in accordance with the general statutes of Connecticut. This ordinance shall become effective with the term beginning 2025. Date prepared uh, January 3rd, 2023. Prepared by Sheila M. Bailey, the town clerk. Um, right here, 
moved. So, uh, Councillor Mangini and second. a second by Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala. Uh, before we discuss, I'd like to ask Sheila Bailey um, to review the information that we had from the public hearing and what your actual goals are before we before there's any amendments that could come forward. Sure. Um, the town of Enfield is currently um, one of 33 towns in our state that has not set an ordinance to limit the number of justices of the peace. And currently, by state statute, we are allowed to have 5,405 justices. Um, we currently have serving um, between the two parties and the town clerk appointed. We have 93 justices of the peace serving. Um, out of those 93, 32 are performing weddings, and 19 out of those 32 uh, have only performed one wedding since their term started back in um, uh, January of 21. So um, I was proposing, um, I did um, send the council initially at the last, at the public hearing, a chart of various towns that had um, a similar size to us and actually a few towns that were quite a bit larger than us and the number of justices of the peace that they have in their towns. For instance, um, I'm proposing 75 for the town of Enfield. The town of um, city of East Hartford has a total of 45. Greenwich has 45. Manchester has a total of 15. So five Republicans, five Democrats, five town clerk, uh, town clerk appointed. Um, and this is really for administrative purposes. Um, I think last time um, during the endorsements, we had, I'm looking for my number right here. Yes, we had 142 endorsed between the two parties. Um, 76 total came in within their 10 days to get sworn in and receive all their paperwork. So when we get the 142 endorsements, we provide their certificates, we do their signature cards and type them up. We also um, make that many um, Justice of the Peace manuals for them. And out of those um, 142, 66 never showed up. So we did all that work and prepared it, and they didn't come in to receive their oath. Um, so my recommendation is that the town of Enfield pass an ordinance to limit the number of justices of the peace to um, 75, which would be 25 Republicans, 25 Democrats, and 25 town clerk appointed. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. And Councilor uh, Despard. Yeah, I'm just, I'm 100% uh, in support of this ordinance. I actually, I think the number should be lower, um, but I'm, yeah, I'm definitely in support of this. Councilor Hopkins. Uh, I agree. I mean, th this has been thoughtfully considered. I know that Enfield has a history of appointing a lot of justices of the peace, but I think we should base it off of usage. I think it's part of what we're trying to do with professionalizing some parts of the town. I don't really see, see a good reason for having more than 75. Um, I would also personally prefer that it's not based on party, but that's a state level issue. So 75 is great, makes a lot of sense, reduces the work the town clerk has to do, and reduces taxpayer money. So thank you. Councillor Nelson. Okay, I do not support the number 75. We had discussions about this several weeks ago. I went to my town committee, I discussed it with them, and they agreed to 100 each party, which I thought we were in agreement with. Somehow this changed again. So that's my first reason. Second is, so if 79 people came from the two town committees, that's already four more than what you're proposing. And what happens to myself who wants to marry my daughter in a year, but I can't become a JP because somebody who's never married anybody beat me to the punch and they get to sign up first. That's my second concern. And third is how do you track us notarizing documents? Because I use my notary or justice of the peace as a notary and we all can legally. How do you track that? I do not track you that. You do not. So out of the people who are justice, just because they're not doing weddings, we don't know that they're not doing notary work. And they legally can do notary work in the state of Connecticut. And we could be putting them out of business. <coughs> so 
Uh, yes, Nick, it, that is 100% a fact. We don't have the stamp, but we do have the power to notarize papers in the state of Connecticut. So I cannot support this at this time because this is not what we agreed to, and I don't know what the change is. So I would like to make a motion that it go back to the 300 we agreed on, 100 from each party and 100 open. I'll second that. We have a motion on the floor uh, for 100 from each party, which would be a total of 300. Um, there, and there's been a second by Councillor Pisner. Uh, discussion on that, Council. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think that you know we have a bit of a uh, wild system. I think that if somebody you know wants to be a notary, they should go through the, the, the proper procedure to do that. Having it, you know, just doled out by a political party seems a little odd to me. Uh, I mean, I've, I haven't been here that long, but it's an odd way to do it. And I, I don't, you know, want to cast. Oh, pardon me. I don't want to cast aspersions on people. I'm not saying they can't do it. I just, I think to have a huge number of people that it's hard to track. I don't think it makes sense. And if somebody is doing a notary business based on a political appointment, there's a way to formalize that. There are channels to do that. Uh, that's great if somebody wants to do it, but I don't think we should have all this extra work for the town clerk just for that. So I would vote against this uh, motion to amend. Councilor Santanella. Sorry, I just want to be clear I understand. It's possible to be a notary without being a justice of the peace, correct? You can become a notary through a state process and do notary work without being a justice of the peace. It just happens that a justice of the peace can also notarize things. That is is correct. that correct? That's correct. Okay. So you don't have to be a justice of the peace to notarize something. No. And there's another way in which people who just want to notarize things can still have that business and still do that. Got it. Correct. Thank you. Any other comment, uh, Councillor Mangini? Thank you. <clears throat> to clarify also for notary, I'm a notary and JP, uh, we have a stamp and seal. Many documents require the notary stamp and seal. Unless you're an attorney, then you can just write your name. Um, with the Justice of the Peace uh, role, um, you know, Ken does bring up a good point. In addition to his point, I do have to bring forward the fact that as a JP, you are allowed to take a deposition. Not that I would. I never have. I'm not an attorney. But that is one of the um, uh, positions that you can take. I do agree that um, the number is on the lower side. It's a drastic reduction. But I really don't think 300 is the magic number. I would like to see it perhaps maybe, um, I don't know, 50 per town committee and then maybe another 50 for the other group. I think 300 is a little bit too much. But again, I would not want to put extra strain on the town clerk's office either. She has a tremendous amount of work to conduct and handle as it is. So I would um, agree with the, um, uh, you know, amendment, but in a, in a reduction to that. Thank you. Councilor Ungar. Um, per our original conversation, I thought the town clerk recommended 75. And then after everyone discussing it, I thought we resolved it to be 300. So I would support that instead of going from the, the 1,000 or how many that we have to 75. You know, down to 300 um, might be more acceptable or manageable. And also, uh, maybe there's a better way instead of printing up all the material, you know, as people come in, then do it or be assured that they're going to show up so you're not wasting your time. Mm -hmm. It'd be a, a better way to uh, do it. Councillor Santanella. Just as another question, I'm sorry. So if we change the number, we had a public hearing based on it being 75. If we change the number, do we need to have another public hearing with a new set number? Or I, I'm just uh, no, procedurally, I don't how do we so. do that? It would be amended at, you know, if the amendment is adopted, it would go into the newspaper with the adopted amount, the amended amount. Got it. And you said the total active that we have now is 90? 93, and that includes the town clerk appointments. That includes the town clerk appointments. So right now we're at 93. Correct. Okay. 
Thank you. So I'd All right, like well, to amend at, my motion. At, 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 the, at this point in time, we, we have a, a motion on the floor that we did not vote on yet. Right. I'd like to our, amend it. Before. All right. So we have. We have to, you have to draw, draw it, then make another amendment. Well. Okay, so let's go. At this point, we will drop your previous. He has to he has to okay, go ahead. I make right. a motion to withdraw my motion. Whoever second has to withdraw their second. Second. There it is. second by Councilor Pisner. I'd like to make a motion for 150 if Councilman Mangini would agree with us. And I think that's a fair compromise. Is there a second? A second. Uh, oh. second. A, a second by Councillor Pisner. Uh, the, the motion that if there's any discussion on this, uh, I myself uh, like the compromise uh, from going down to that and bringing that total down, which will definitely help out uh, the town man, uh, town clerk uh, with this from going to uh, from 100 to 50, uh, which would be a total of 150 for the three sections. Councillor um, Despard. Yeah, I just want to go on the record of being against that. It just, it feels like we're, I don't know, um, playing around with taxpayer dollars at this point for like a, uh, for ourselves. So, um, because we want to be ingratiated with something, um, it's just really feeling weird to me and um, for lack of a better term, and I'm just vehemently opposed. Okay, I, I'm gonna make one, one final comment. Considering uh, the total was uh, over 4,000 and we're bringing it down, or 5,000 and we're bringing it down to, to 150, I think that's going to be a manageable. And, uh, and if out of those 150, people can't make the commitment to doing their paperwork, obviously they're, they're not going to be allowed to perform any marriages. So. Uh, <coughs> So one final comment, we'll vote on the amendment by Councillor Nelson and we'll move forward. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just, you know, and this may be, you know, my bias as an attorney seeing the legal system. These things are really important. And I and I, the, the functions of a justice of the peace, I don't think it makes sense to have, you know, a town political party doling these things out. You should go through the proper process of getting certified to do these things. Just being a member of the party, the party seems to like you. That's a problem in my books. I will absolutely vote against this. I think limiting it to 75 keeps it nice and tight. There are people who do this legitimately. They do it professionally, but, you know, it's, it's, there's not a good history there. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will now vote on the motion for 150. Um, <clears throat> okay, justices of the peace. All in favor of 150, raise your hand. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight in favor, and uh, against, three against, eight in favor, three against. And to be clear, um, Mayor, that was for the amendment, correct? So that is now, correct. And now we have to vote on the um, ordinance as amended. The main motion as amended. Um, I believe this will have to be a roll, roll call vote. Okay. Sheila, roll call. Councilor Mangini? Four. Councilor Nelson? Four. Councilor Pisner? Four. Councilor Santanella? Four. Councilor Ungeyer? Four. Uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala? Against. Mayor Crisati? Four. Councilor Despard? Against. Councilor Finger? Four. Councilor Hopkins? Against. And Councilor Ludwig? Four. That's eight in favor, three against, and no abstentions. Item 13, any other business proper to come before the said meeting? I sense none. Number 14, public communications. Any person wishing to speak before the council, please state your name and address for the record. You'll have three minutes. Anybody wishing to address the council? Mary Ann Turner, Seven Meadow Road. I'm here to talk about Bob T. Katz. Mr. T. Katz passed away last week. Um, I had talked to Bob 
um, in the last few weeks. Um, he was very ill. But like Marge Jaziniak and L.L. Thompson of Skidiko, or what did she say? Hazardville. Of Hazardville section of Skidiko. These are the characters that have made us. Now, those are the three that I know. I'm sure that if people are listening, they'll be able to mention others. Bob would come in front of you, and he would spout off his statistics, which I would sit in the back of the room knowing full well he was making up. But he could get away with it, because when you're in public participation, you can say whatever you want. Um, as much as Bob could be Bob. He, um, and I would say he probably annoyed the Republicans more than he annoyed the Democrats. I would always keep an open mind with Bob. I would call him periodically and say, stop what you're doing. You know, if you want to yell at somebody, could yell at them sometimes too. Um, but I did see Bob the day he died. He did speak to me. Um, he wanted you to know that uh, he loved Enfield, he told me. And uh, I think he will be missed. He's a character in his own right. We need to take the Bob T. Katz as maybe, now that I have so much time on my hands, I could be the new Bob T. Katz. We'll see if I can <laughs> really get that good at it. But anyway, I wanted to let you know that um, the Margaret Jaziniaks, the Mr. Plopper, the L.L. Thompson, was that? Is that what I had? Todd Collins and Bob T. Katz should always be remembered. And I always think sometimes that we should have little name badges on a chair or two just in their memory. But uh, please understand that Bob did love you, and he told me so, and I wanted to pass that on. And even though he might have been Bob in his own way, I think over the, his funeral services will be January 28th at Leet Stevens. Um, I'm not telling you to do anything. Um, his wife... Um, we can send her a card if you're interested. But the long and the end of it, he will be missed. And I wanted you to know that I was thinking about him and, and what a curious person he was to all of you and previous councils, too. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to come in front of the council tonight? Councilor communications are declared over. Um, I, I do. Uh, I'm glad, Marianne, that you came up to speak about Bob. I wanted to end tonight's meeting um, with a tribute to Bob. Um, over the past, I would say, five years, Bob T. Katz said, you're only, you're only one of the Democrats that I enjoyed talking to. Um, I developed a very close relationship with him. Like Marianne, I did visit him in the nursing home, um, gave him some clothes while he was in the nursing home so that he looked appropriate. Um, he did love the town of Enfield. One of his last words to me was, keep doing what you're doing for the town because everybody, including yourself, and everybody on the council are doing what's right for Enfield. So we will continue to do that. Uh, he will, I will miss him. He was a frequent visitor to my house when I was home. Uh, he would always say, Jesus Christ, you're never home. And uh, so, but the times that he did come over, we spent a lot of good times. And I do have to say, that he took a special liking to my son, and I really appreciate that. He was a special man, and I know that everybody had maybe their differences and everybody had their stories about him, but overall, he was very genuine, and he will be sorely missed. Um, I know his services are coming up next week, and um, if you have that opportunity to go, I think that we, uh, we all should go and pay tribute to Bob. So thank you very much. I'm asking for uh, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Councillor uh, Nelson and uh, second by Councillor Mangini. Uh, good night, everyone, and uh, have, have a nice uh, rest of the week.